So you have a horse, uh, he's uh, two to one. He's going to pay $6.40, right? You're going to bet $40 into the race, but all of it is contingent on this horse win. You're going to bet exactly as you're going to bet tries trying to make a score. All right, so you whiff on all of that. And meanwhile, you could have had 40 to win on the horse and got back $128 for your 40. You would have been up $84, right? Or $88. Uh, but why would you do that when you could fuck it up? That's what we do. <laughs> And then show the guy your losing ticket with your bad breath. Uh, you know, you just had a salami sandwich and, uh, you know, something that was laced with garlic. And you get right in the guy's face and, whoa, look at that. He left out the two. <laughs> like anybody wants to hear about your sorry losing ways, especially in those circumstances, because they're losing too. If you're, you know, happen to know the guy's winning, maybe throws you a couple of bucks and says, uh, you know, here, the forest, get out of my face. Or you're whining and you're fetching. Unbelievable. No, nothing worse than a guy. Sh I, is there anything worse in a gambling situation than a guy showing he was losing ticket at the track? Oh, yeah, that's the worst. And they all, and you all do it. Awesome. Bitch. Everybody, right? Oh, oh, look, look at that. I left out the two. Well, you're an asshole. That's why you left out the two. <laughs> you lost. Just admit it. <laughs> You're a lousy handicapper, a poor money manager, and you really have no business being here in the first place. And guess what? You haven't had a winning year in your life. But there we are. <laughs> Every day. The time. Wake up with Defo. Joined by Luby. Welcome to the Defo Show. Every day is a new day. Every day. Na, na, na. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you here. On the uh, Depot Show, Jeff DeForest, that smiling gentleman on the other side of the screen there, is one Mike Luby Lubitz, which uh, I have to say, Luby, I don't know where you are. You, you've relocated a few times here uh, on the show. But uh, this business where you look like an FBI agent, where you're staking out and you have a couple of boards behind you that uh, lead to, like, John Gotti as the kingpin of the FBI, and you got all the pictures of the mob guys, the underbosses. I like this background a lot better than that uh, weird dorm room crib, as uh, my friend Southern Brian pointed out, that, that it does look like you're coming from your dorm room in Tallahassee. I know you don't care about this stuff. Well, it's not bad. It's in the next month, I'll have my own studio. So it's like... Oh, beautiful. Now, are you going to yeah, do something design-wise? I have a whole do? idea. I have, you know, Jersey got me that Bobby Bowden thing, so I can finally put that up. I have a Charlie Ward helmet. I have an Alonzo Morning basketball. I have the Brendan I basketball. I have all the bobbleheads I ever had in the studio. So, yes, I've, I just haven't had a place to put them. My wife makes me put them in the closet, and there's no room in this home. So this week she's not here. I'm in her office yeah. and we, we close on our new home. At the end of the month, we'll do some work and I will start hopefully the end of middle to end of November. I'll actually have a studio. Hallelujah. Wow, I've been trying great. for that. People ask for like, I want to have a cocktail. been one of the most frequent comments I hear about the show. Everybody loves you, Louie. And uh, they're like uh, surprised, uh, you know, your evolution uh, as a talk show host has been incredible over the 12 years that we've been working together. Now, I, I did, uh, and I, I bring this up for a reason here. This, uh, If you're just listening, you're missing out on this. But I have my mini Howard Schnellenberger bobblehead, the one okay. remaining one. I used to have two of these. Uh, one of them broke. And uh, we used to use this to warn off gremlins on all outside remotes. <laughs> People would wonder, well, why do you have a bobblehead of Howard Schnellenberger sitting on the table wherever I was uh, when I was doing radio shows uh, outside locations? I think we were on location a couple of times a week, Gulfstream Park, Hialeah. Yeah. And uh, I always took this thing out to uh, warn off the uh, natural gremlins that uh, somehow in, uh, evade uh, any attempt at a successful outside show. Mm -hmm. I probably should bring this on the Mike Mayo lunchbox when we do the uh, Mayo <laughs> lunchbox outside. You should. Well, we, we haven't had too many problems there. I mean, there's always uh, some so, issue so. of Wi-Fi, like, uh, and it's weird. You need the secret code and everything. I, I would not be able to put those shows on the air, Louie. You know me. And, I, and I, I've been able to handle and put out uh, any number of uh, almost, uh, you know, forest fire type blazes. Uh, of technical issues that I've incurred over the years. Uh, and it, it seems to boil down to just a couple of things. I, either you're going to get on the air or you're fucked. <laughs> 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 fucked is not a good position. Uh, sometimes. sometimes it's a great position. Sometimes it's not so good. All right. But, yeah. uh, we, we, but we, we like to deliver on our promise here, especially with all of our sponsors, money riding on us pulling off successful shows and drawing in massive audiences of people that are paying attention for the entire two hours. Now, you have good reason to pay attention in the second hour of the show today because we'd be joined by the great John Congemi. Uh, John, all over TV, still uh, dissecting everything about the Miami Dolphins. But uh, what I love about John is 
he, he says he goes out golfing on Saturday, but uh, I, I don't know that he doesn't take in every second of every possible piece of video that's available on college football. So he really knows his stuff on that. And then, of course, is uh, diving all in on these Dolphin games. And uh, even though he worked for the Finn Siders for a while, uh, he is very objective when it comes to the Dolphins. And, and you know, you have to tread a little bit because uh, all, all of my career pretty much here in South Florida, I, I was usually involved with the uh, flagship station, as they would call it, uh, of the Miami Dolphins. Uh, wh- wherever I was, at WIOD, they had the Dolphins. WQAM, they had the Dolphins. 790. They had the Dolphins. Even 940 when we got there, they had the Dolphins until they blew that and eventually blew the entire sports uh, thing that they had going there. And uh, now they're uh, immersed in uh, what seems to be a very common theme. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine yesterday. He said, hey, so what are you doing these days? I said, I'm doing video streaming. He says, what? Not on the radio anymore? And where, you know, when it, when it first occurred, I thought, well, this is not a good development, mostly because we had devised a pretty good system of finding a way to beat the system by being on local radio, by uh, just taking it into our own hands there and uh, uh, more or less making it our property. We're kind of leasing space in a way yep. without having to pay any money, which is the ideal situation. I dreamt about that my whole life. <laughs> the only bigger dream, as I've stated many times, would have been to sign a very, very fat a uh, five-year contract, and then get fired on the first day of a guaranteed contract. I mean, Matt, Rule, Matt Rule's in a good spot. They own $40 million. <laughs> Imagine it. <laughs> it was only uh, there two and a half years. <laughs> if you're going to fail at anything, fail at being a head coach. Yes. Pretty much any sport. Fail at being a head coach, especially football. College football now is up there in the same uh, upper echelon of pay scale as the pros. And uh, this Matt Rule, he, he didn't do too well there with Carolina, huh? No. I had some tough luck. I don't know if he was in the best of circumstances, but uh, certainly didn't distinguish himself as being a guy that uh, could could deal with that. I mean, look at Brian Flores, what he did with garbage here with the Miami Dolphins. And yet, very unlikely, he'll get another head coaching job in the NFL. Would you say that that's a fair statement? Do you ever see Brian Flores' name circulating with any head coaching position? No chance, right? He'll have to do the rehabbing. Like maybe Tomlin can be a rehab for him, like uh, Saban is for all those other coaches. Maybe if he's in with Tomlin for three or four years, and you forget about some of this stuff, and it never getting up. another shot, zero, <laughs> zero chance. <laughs> he's suing the league. I know. Is that still out there in that lawsuit? We don't hear much about that. The league always finds a way to crush any negativity that's coming from uh, a- any individual that's going against them. Those guys usually find themselves walking the streets, wandering around, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, some crazy person just saying, uh, I can't believe it happened to me. I can't believe it happened to me. <laughs> kind of like those guys we were talking about in that clip to open the show that are at the track. Going, Why can you believe this? I left out the two. I left out the two. Always bad breath, too. Like rabbi-like bad breath. <laughs> Very distinct, like rabbi breath. Not to condemn rabbis. They're fine Usually people. Like They're obviously yeah. in pursuit of very virtuous <laughs> things on behalf of the Lord and trying to uh, spare your spirituality from uh, going south. But uh, at least in my experience, I don't know about you, Luby. Did you take bar mitzvah lessons? Yeah. Well, I went to Hebrew school and then the cantor, also that whole six months before. The cantor was probably no prize either, man. See, I like their candor, but the breath was always bad. And he was a sweet guy, but you're not wrong. And they're like right here. It's like, okay. <laughs> Is it poor dental hygiene or just the stuff they eat? Maybe a combination of both. Right? both. I mean, can't brush my teeth. It's Saturday. All right. That makes sense. All right. Um, I spent yesterday uh, in kind of a, a very spiritual fashion, I guess, uh, part of yesterday. And, uh, you know, and, and part of it I spent uh, by myself there on the beach for a little while. It was beautiful out there. Absolutely gorgeous. And Got a chance to spend a couple of hours there because I had to blow off my appointment with my accountant for the uh, tax thing. Because no it turned out I, I couldn't get any of my documents. Uh, somehow uh, they, you know, we were in a process of uh, getting a loan at the bank that they had all of my information from uh, 2021, which I'm not that far behind, right? Let me, I mean, I'm going to be uh, able you. to meet the extended <laughs> deadline. You've been doing three years behind before. <laughs> oh, geez. No, I was in a real jackpot before uh, my mom passed away. Thank you, mom. God. 
There was nothing like having a, a wad of cash come your way. I mean, except for the fact that, I, you know, I didn't have my mother anymore. I mean, I was never really counting on that, but uh, it did help in certain uh, situations. Yeah, like the 50 dimes that I owe the IRS. <laughs> 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 I, I figured I was going to die before I ever paid it off, uh, you know, because I was paying them off on time payments just to keep them off my back. And uh, the time payments were never going to be enough to keep pace with the escalating interest rate. I'm waiting for Biden, though. I'm hoping he gets reelected so that in a you know raw moment of dementia, he forgives all debt to the government. <laughs> he does away to- with the American tax <laughs> system. Yeah, I mean, that would be great if he just did away with federal income tax by accident mm-hmm. one day and rubber stamped that thing before yeah. the Republicans had a chance to go ahead and, uh, you know, shoot it down. That would be nice, wouldn't it? That'd be uh, you know better than a lot of the other things that this uh, guy has considered. That, that, that's for sure. But I, I had to talk uh, my friend Ira the Met fan off of the Brooklyn Bridge yesterday. Oh jeez. Oh my God. I mean, you talk. This is a diehard baseball fan. You know that, Luby, from me. Oh yeah. Diehard baseball fan, uh, and he has been a Met fan uh, since the existence of the Mets. Hates the Dodgers. Despises the Dodgers. In fact, he told me he can't watch any more of the playoffs because the only teams that are left there, besides the Cleveland Guardians are teams that he hates. Now, he, he was old enough uh, when the Dodgers left Brooklyn to, uh, you know, actually have that become an emotional rift in his lifetime mm. where, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, you, you just had a team get up and go. I, I, I really uh, wasn't conscious of uh, how impactful that was at the time because I think, what, I was like five years old when the Dodgers left Brooklyn. It was that 1956? So, uh, you know, they bailed out to Los Angeles. I, I kind of vaguely remember, uh, you know, things about it. But I, I wasn't a Dodger fan then because everybody in my neighborhood was a Yankee fan, even at five years old. We, we were all in on, on the New York Yankees, and for good reason, right? 56, as a matter of fact, happened to be maybe the best season of Mickey Mantle's career. Is that possible to make that statement? I, I think he had like 50 homers, hit 350. I mean, it was an unbelievable year. For uh, Mickey Mantle, the young Mick, who was a swashbuckling superstar, I mean, of Brad Pitt type proportions in terms of, uh, you know, just looking the part. And uh, that, that was great. But I, I don't really remember uh, being too, too upset uh, with the Dodgers leaving Brooklyn as a five year old. Uh, Ira, my friend, Ira, the Met fan, though, I would say, what? He's probably 15 years older than me. Yeah, he's in his so- 80s. So, yeah, I mean, this was a devastating blow for these people. So uh, he told me he, he can't watch any more of the playoffs. And on top of that, he was condemning the state of Florida, not because it's governed by Ron DeSantis and represented in the Senate by Rick Scott and uh, Marco Rubio, two complete clowns. Uh, this this Rick Scott is uh, mind boggling. Uh, I, I, I don't want to get sidetracked on him because what has he done? Has he done anything? Uh, either well, as love- governor or senator that, that you would remember besides being like- an asshole. He just every time he talks, it reminds me of your favorite one of your favorite sayings, "Woman, what woman?" Like, yeah. he to this day, it's still the highest fine in healthcare in American history, and he's the first one to say when everyone else is wrong. I, it is amazing his deniability. Yeah. It is amazing. It's like, dude, really? <laughs> how, 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 why are we electing all of these clowns and criminals? I mean, uh, why are they even running? I, I guess because that's the direction that the uh, country is going in. I, I had a joke up on uh, my Facebook page. I, I just It occurred to me, uh, I guess it was Saturday, and I'm at the refrigerator, and, I, and I'm eating like weird combinations of stuff. Uh, I'm eating potato salad, uh, you know, a couple of spoons of potato salad and a piece of turkey bacon and this. And I, and I realized, wow, I'm eating like I'm stoned. And then I thought, well, there's a good reason for it. I am stoned. So I, I put that up on my Facebook page because, I mean, uh, people are, are expecting to see, you know, some joke material there for me. Uh, you know, well, what else would you figure it was going to be on my Facebook page? The Declaration of Independence? No. <laughs> <laughs> Magna Carta <laughs> An analysis of the theory of relativity No, it's like, hey, I'm eating like I'm stoned Because I'm stoned That was it, alright So uh, all of the people got it Except for one guy, and I, I don't know I mean, I, I used to just click on anybody That sent me a friend request yeah. And that was it And uh, at one time, I guess I had like the maximum of 5,000 friends I think that's diminished by some But uh, I don't pay attention to it anymore And I rarely accept any friend requests because who knows if they're legit, yeah. even if they're from people that you know, right? I mean, I left that, <laughs> exactly. and, and, and it's sort of insulting, I, you know, the way social media works. Like it used to be, you know, you, you would go over to a girl and ask her for a date. And when she told you, well, I'm sorry, I'm busy that night. And then you say, well, what about another night? She said, well, I'm going to be busy the rest of my life when it comes to you. <laughs> 
And you felt such rejection. My God, yeah, you would go home and lay face down on the bed. And maybe, you know, do it yourself there, uh, you know, masturbate, <laughs> thinking about the girl. And then just take her, you know, right off the, the radar and, and, and wipe her completely out of your mind forever. That was it. The rejection was, was uh, overwhelming. Yeah. But, uh, you know, equally, I mean, I guess today's version of that is, uh, you know, throwing out a friend request to somebody and they don't respond. <laughs> no, 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 they may be dead for all you know. I mean, uh, how, how do you know? Maybe they don't even use social media anymore. They realized, uh, OK, you know, this isn't for me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, too disappointing, too depressing, uh, you know, and, and yet I, I enjoy, obviously, I'm in the communications business, so I love communicating with people and, and, and I kind of like it. I get a kick out of it as, uh, you know, you can promote things like this and, you know, ha have a good time. And, you know, I, I like the aspect that you get in touch with people that you probably would have never found again in your lifetime. All, all of a sudden, there's someone back in your life. But, uh, yeah, I was always, it's amazing that the ugly feeling that you got, uh, you know, there's just a weird feeling when, when somebody didn't accept your friend request or worse, I'm friend you. they defriended you. That's, <laughs> that became a big thing. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to live. Charlie <laughs> defriended me. Yeah. I'm not going to see his stupid posts of a slice of pizza and, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever it was that he had for breakfast the other day. Uh, you know, what am I, how am I going to go on living with, with, with the circumstances as they are? Um, so anyway, I, I don't know that the one guy uh, and I don't know, you know, I don't know this guy. I, I didn't really recognize his name. I've never, you know, come across him before. I, I guess he was one of my friends and he posts a comment up there and, and it says uh, it figures this country has gone to shit. Because you have a guy bragging about being stoned and everybody loves it. Yeah. Right. Whoa. I tell you what. <laughs> Mr. Utilidon. <laughs> so I figured, who is this asshole? You know, so yeah. I look him up and all he's got is like MAGA this and, uh, you know, pictures of Trump. And I thought, OK, there you go. That's the side that you want to take. You, you want to I, like, I don't under like, why is now smoking a bipartisan thing, <laughs> a partisan thing? I'm sorry. Like, we's only for one group. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, many of these guys need to be smoking weed. Exactly. You, you would have to think that they were doing something far more severe and damaging to the mind than weed could possibly be. I, I, I'm not sure I really want to come on the show and be an advocate yeah. for the medicinal values of marijuana. I'm not, I'm not sure yeah, I'm if that's really true. For me, it works. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm still here and I'm laughing all the way to the wire. So, uh, you know, I mean, that would put me well ahead of the pack in most cases. Because uh, what, what good does it do to worry? Which is what I try to explain to Ira the Met fan. Mm. What good does it do to uh, have all of this anxiety? I, I mean, uh, I want to say Ira's like uh, 86, maybe. He was in his 80s. Like, he was in his 80s, I swear you told me when I met him. And that was like a decade ago. <laughs> a decade ago, yeah. <laughs> This guy's been in his 80s for the last 20 years. Exactly. It's kind of like the poly man has been dying of the same heart attack for the last 50 years, my good friend. When I met him, he was like, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. That was 40-something years ago. That was poly man. I don't know. I mean, look, I, I, and I have vivid memories of a lot of things that I experienced with this guy because uh, he sort of had it together. And uh, he was the uncle of a really good friend of mine. And we used to hang out at this guy's place, and it was at the you know very height of the hippy dippy era. I was about uh, 17, 18 years old at the time, and uh, that period of time where we used to be able to just go and do anything at Ira and uh, his wife, his name Rosalie, at their house, including having like band practices on a Wednesday night at three in the morning, and uh, you know the police would come and everything, and they, they were all cool about okay as long as you stop playing, uh, you know, try not to do this again, right? And meanwhile, you know, you're playing like Stairway to Heaven at the <laughs> highest volume that you possibly could come up with, uh, you know, through the night. Uh, and we used to go there. We used to smoke weed, do whatever, hang out, listen to music, uh, you know, bring girls over there. It was uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, and the guy was as free a spirit as you could possibly be and very welcoming uh, of the younger people that were coming in there through, uh, you know, Bob, uh, my friend Bob and, and uh, his friends. It was great. It was paradise because you kind of had like a, a, a Dallas Cowboys situation where, where you had a separate house that you could go to yeah <laughs> away from your parents and and do whatever the fuck you want it, it was just absolutely great uh so i love this guy and uh yeah he he would have to be somewhere like mid 80s at this point he could not deal with this mets defeat wow. it, it was so ugly i mean it wasn't like he's not one of these guys that's blaming everybody 
And, and I told him, I said, look, Ira, uh, San Diego had, had, had a very good team. It's not like these guys were bums that they were going against. I mean, they, they traded for Soto. They got Bell in the same deal. They already had Machado, who, who could easily be the MVP in the National League this year. I mean, um, it, it's a possibility, is it not? Hit 296, over 30 homers, knocked in over, uh, I think he knocked in 100 runs. Something like that. And uh, that was on a San Diego team that was kind of uh, underperforming for the most part. Yep. They won about 90 games. They weren't great, but, uh, you know, they were good enough down the stretch to hang on and earn the spot there. And uh, they faced the New York Mets as uh, what? They would have been the number five seed. Was that it? Was it a four versus five? Uh, the uh, Mets the Mets didn't win the division, so they couldn't have been the third seed. Um, and, and anyway, uh, they beat them. Uh, you know, uh, two out of three, anything can happen. Short series, Major League Baseball. You could go into the uh, biggest losing city uh, in in the league at the end of the year, needing to win one game, uh, which, look, the, the Braves almost blew it by losing two out of three to the Marlins. I, I don't know how much effort they put into that last game once they clinched. But uh, after beating the Mets three straight to uh, get into a commanding position, they only needed to win one game against the Marlins. They lose the first one. You know they were trying there. And they eke out a 2-1 victory in the second one. I, I said, Ira, look, by the most infinitesimal of, of margins, the uh, the Mets found themselves uh, you know, in, in a compromising position, had to play that first series. And, and look, you're probably playing a good team, no? And, uh, you know, he ends up losing, but uh, couldn't deal with it. Won't watch baseball anymore. I, I literally had to talk him off a ledge. I have never heard a man so depressed in my life. It's funny because he's always happy, and he doesn't take a lot seriously. I, right. Really to, to, for Ira to get, like. He's been there. smoking weed since then. <laughs> and good weed, too. I mean, that was the other thing, right? Uh, it's always great back in the day when you used to go to your friend's house, and while you had, uh, you know, some uh, you know marijuana that was purchased for $10 a bag in Mexico, uh, this guy was smoking, uh, you know, something that came from uh, the islands of Hawaii. Yeah, he that was like grown. Right. Now it'd be grown by, uh, you know, uh, by Don Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I mean, I read, I read Rosalie are like classic. Yeah, I don't classic man throwbacks. He's, said. He's so funny. Like we would throw the craziest shit at him. He's like, yeah, it's whatever. <laughs> In a time warp too. I mean, uh, just still <laughs> thinking that we're all going to get together one day. Come on, people now. Smile on your brother. Everybody get together. I mean, you can hear the young bloods coming out of this guy's mouth every time he speaks. Try to love one another right now. He's, he looks like the definition of it. Like if you don't know what a hippie's supposed to look like yeah. and you're younger, Ira's Throwback. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still got the uh, ponytail there, the hair. I mean, he's got the wild, uh, you know, hair. Uh, you, you, you don't know if I was walking into the room or Robert Plant. I mean, you're just not sure. <laughs> oh my God. I, I don't get like that. I, I, my team loses, they lose. Okay. My team lost last night. I had a chance to go 8 0 against Francesco. Oh, no. You, yeah. you had the Raiders? No, no. I had, uh, I had the Chiefs playing seven last night. Chiefs. And they were in a position to cover. And then, wow, what a strange move this was, huh? I mean, uh, what what are these guys thinking? Uh, Andy Reid, he's up seven, right? Yeah. Now, the logical move was go up eight because at that point, you, you not only are up a touchdown, but the uh, Raiders would have had to get a two-point conversion plus a touchdown late in the ball game to tie the game. So what does Reid do? He goes for two to go up nine. Oh, to go up nine? If they went up nine, I mean, they're, they're up seven after they scored a touchdown. They had been down 17 nothing early in this game. Did you watch the beginning of this game? It was all I watched the game. Yeah, Las it was Vegas all Raiders. Raiders. All it was Raiders. Seven. And then before half, the Schwanky guy made some miraculous kick, and I was like, oh, okay, this may be it. Oh, yeah, and then uh, that Kansas City kicker had been doing okay, I think, up until this week when all of a sudden, whoosh, he had a case of the FSUs, man. Everything was sailing wide right. Mm -hmm. And then he nailed a 15 yarder, and I was like, okay, this this feels like it's going Chiefs way, and that's when I went to bed. Did you see the clips, by the way? They had a nice illustration of this on uh, ESPN, where uh, the Arizona kicker who, who missed, uh, like, I think it was Arizona, he missed, like, a field goal, and it just, it's going straight down the middle, and then it sails straight to the right, just like oh, some of your geez. golf shots, Luby. Exactly. And, and they showed him warming up. He, he missed a kick, I guess, uh, at the end of the game. Uh, and I'm not sure if it was that game. It might have been uh, another one where it uh, comes down to a, a final field goal try. And the guy's inside of like, uh, you know, just gimme range for any NFL kicker, like 35 yards out. And uh, he, he kicks it. And, and then the ball just takes off and cuts. I mean, just a uh, complete fade to the right. 
misses and, uh, you know, team loses the ball game. Coach throws this stuff down and, uh, you know, well, what are you going to do? Strangle a guy? I don't know. I keep going back to uh, that story that uh, the great Jim McKinley told me when he was coaching the Arizona Outlaws. The kicker missed uh, an attempt right before the end of the half. And at halftime, they actually ripped his name off the locker and sent him packing. Really? Right out of there. Yeah, <laughs> cut him in halftime. <laughs> that was the USFL. Nobody knew what was going on there. They, they let Donald Trump be an owner. What are you talking about? Mm. Nice job there, Donnie boy, burying that league. Uh, uh, would we not have taken that as a little bit of a sign that maybe it wasn't going to go so well for the country? The guy couldn't run a football league that was about to prosper. He ran him right into the ground. What do you mean he's the only guy that runs a casino in Vegas into the ground? <laughs> you don't have to do yeah. anything. They run themselves. Atlantic City, yeah. AC, whatever. Lost money in a casino. <laughs> like it's an automatic. <laughs> like <laughs> it's designed for you to lose. I mean, maybe not big uh, like you do every time. I mean, uh, think about this. If they took a 1% rake off every spin of a slot machine. Yeah, it's it. It doesn't matter uh, who wins. Some lady could go running out of there with 60 dimes. Uh, overall, the casino is making uh, whatever percentage it is that they take. Now, now here in Florida, I, I guess, uh, you know, the, the the deal is like, uh, you know, if, uh, Eight or nine percent, or something. I think on the slot machines, a lot of these casinos. Oh my god! Are you kidding? Yeah. So then you have no <laughs> chance, zero, in most casinos except Hialeah Park. See, they went against that. <laughs> exactly. They have the freedom to choose what what, what they want to take out, but uh, it's significantly higher than it is, uh, say, in Las Vegas, where uh, do you see people winning a lot of money on slots in Las Vegas? No, right? Once in a while, <laughs> I put a dollar in, and I want a hundred. Okay, good luck. Keep doing it, lady. See what happens. <laughs> it's going to be over soon. Cause, but the casino doesn't care, right? I mean, they have like a, if you were an expert craps player, you're, you're still paying into like a, uh, I think a 1% or 1.5% 1 .1 house advantage. Mm -hmm. If you played the game perfectly, Luby, had a bankroll to last over the long haul, you, you, you're going to get ground down by logic by like a 1% or 2%. No matter what. So think about that. If you're churning $1,000, uh, okay, every time a guy does that, uh, the uh, casino is uh, picking up 20 bucks. Now multiply that by all of the people that are in there and every minute that goes by, they're making money. Yes. It, it's unbelievable. But uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're in there uh, playing against the juice and th that's always going to be the thing. As uh, That's my thing. Trump has found ways to lose when other when it's almost impossible. So yes, he 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 alone almost ruined that league, hundred percent. Oh, a thousand percent. Uh, McKinley, when he went to his grave, was uh, still cursing out Donald Trump, and he was a staunch Republican. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, he passed well before Trump was running for president. I mean, he never. I mean, uh, he probably. Uh, you know, you hate to say this sometimes, but uh, maybe it was fortunate, right? Like with my dad, if he ever saw what was going on, he he would have laughed at it. But I mean, he would have been appalled by what's happening in American politics today, appalled by what's going on where, I mean, the, the more diabolical, the, the more, uh, you know, uh, transparent of a liar you are, uh, the more uh, hypocritical you are, the more it enhances your chances of winning. Yeah, it's <laughs> great. It's a Jimmy Swaggart world, my friend. Yes. <laughs> oh, forgive me because I have sinned. Exactly. Uh, what are we going to do with that? A anyway, I had a chance to go uh, eight. No, against my buddy in my uh, personal bookmaking ventures. You want to be the book. I rest my case about the whole Trump thing in the Atlantic City casinos. Now, Atlantic City ha had a downturn in terms of uh, tourism. Is that possible? Can we make any excuses for this man? Because he wasn't paying any of his bills either. But almost impossible, I would think, if you owned a casino, it's almost impossible to lose money, right? It's like you own waterfront property here yes. in Florida. <laughs> no matter what the You're market. losing money on that. You're a loser. <laughs> That's all there is to it. A loser. Anyway, he, he got out of that thing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I and I had a shot there. Should I have parlayed that? I was I was thinking about that. What, what if I had parlayed every year that I do this thing? I, I think about parlaying uh, Francesco's picks, uh, you know, in, in, you know, with like a stick parlay on like an eight team or like that. Imagine. I, but you would have hedged off by then. Right. I, mean, I would I, hope. I mean, you would have had to have several thousand dollars on the Raiders last night. <laughs> no, if you were in a position to catch an eighteen parlay with a hundred dollars, what is that? With, with, with like massive underdogs, also. That'd be depressing to hit seven of eight and then lose it all because of the one team. Like you can't. Like that would be bad. 
Yeah, I, I don't. Kid, kids are doing that though in, in this age of degeneracy. Oh, that, that is, kids are loons. They're, they're doing twenty team ass. parlays. They're like ten team soccer uh, unders. You know, I mean, uh, all, all unders, which is probably not a bad bet, right? I don't mean any offense to uh, Jim Sarney. I know he's all excited about the uh, Inter Miami FC uh, playoff run here. <laughs> Does he texts you. He texts me these long texts with the things we have to talk about, and I'm like. I couldn't even name a team. <laughs> hey, look, he's probably not wrong. I mean, that, that's the way it should be. You, you should be diversified. You should be able to, uh, you know, cover a little bit of everything. But uh, where do you draw the line on uh, major sports? Now, uh, South Florida had always surprised me uh, as a sports talk guy because uh, you, you literally, and this was true, and my buddy Andy Kaplan used to say this, and I've, I've uh, said this, passed this along before, but uh, uh, he was telling me if you had a, a radio station, this was when sports radio stations were really expanding, 90s, and 90s. coming into vogue there, and you had four or five uh, 24 hour sports stations here. And some of them uh, even had guys working nights. Like, uh, you know, you had a guy on a 7 to 10, 7 to 11 shift. Yeah, yeah. For uh, years. A live guy, and usually it was a pretty good talent, you know, like a yeah. decent guy. You, you, you know, you had to have somebody in there. And, and Eddie K was working overnights, overnights. And uh, he, he said to me that in this town, you could probably start a radio station and talk nothing but Dolphins football year round and be successful. That may not be the case today, but I would say 25 years ago, that, that certainly was a viable possibility. A hundred percent. Yeah. At least for sure. Leaving out all other sports. Never mind that there are four baseball playoff games today. Four, Luby. You would still be sitting there talking about the fact, well, I don't know if two had a concussion or not. I'm not sure. You know, and away he got up. I mean, what, what do we really know about any of this? Nothing. Everybody all of a sudden is an expert on uh, uh, an area of science and medicine that is so vague, e even the experts themselves have no idea what the hell is going on. There. I love that they've gone the other way with the Bridgewater, where the Pruder filmed it, and they've broken down the film to say he did not slip. Yeah. Duh. We know he didn't slip. They were just getting the Dolphins. It's clear that the Dolphins couldn't take any chances after the, the Tua nonsense. And Tua still has passed every protocol, by the way. He's still in concussion protocol, but he hasn't failed anything to this point three weeks later. Bridgewater gets up fine, walks up fine. The hit, he didn't even hit his head, yeah. but there's no way the Dolphins could take any chances. Now, I love how the Twitter backlash is, but this is egregious. They're going the other way. It's like, duh, people. You didn't see that happening? I could have told you that was going to happen. Are you kidding me? Because it's very undefined. I mean, as we've been saying throughout the week here, uh, or, you know, the last couple of weeks since this was an issue, uh, there, there's no way to completely legislate the risks of playing the game of football out of the game. That There's just no way to do it. I mean, uh, you, you can go through all of the – unless you change the nature of the game itself. Yeah, well, right. As long as you have guys crashing into each other, you have a problem. And if that's a design of the game, even if they weren't, I mean, people get injured, uh, you know, serious injuries in, in all sports, right? Basketball players, uh, they go up for a rebound. A guy sort of cuts under their legs. They end up hitting their back and their head on the, on the wood court. Yeah. Hockey. I mean, uh, look, for years they played the game without wearing helmets. And even with them, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, the helmet may be a, even more uh, of uh, a, a uh, you know, a uh, predetermined, uh, you know, way of getting a concussion than, than if you just were out there like soccer players with no helmet on. And why aren't soccer players wearing helmets since they crash their heads together all the time, right? Imagine putting helmets on boxers. That wouldn't work. Well, that's uh, like, and I, and I was talking to my buddy who was visiting the other day, and he was a big soccer guy, and we, he was we were talking about how football is bad and the – uh, two of things before Bridgewater and he's we brought up soccer and he's like most of it and Ken we were with Ken we were going to trivia and Mo, and Ken even said he's like most of it's not on the headers it's they'll hit going for the header they'll hit their head yeah. okay so why don't they wear a helmet like I don't I don't understand the mincing between oh, the, the head clashes are unbelievable all the time it happens yes I'm surprised that there, there isn't uh, more of that uh, in soccer a anyway I mean the point being that you cannot legislate all of the risks of a high risk game out of the game. It, it, it just, it's not possible to do. So, I mean, uh, I, and I, it brings up a great trivia question too. You, you know, the uh, guy in the whiskey and, and, and we got to know him yes. a little bit. We've had him on no. before anyone. He's now a national phenom. Yeah. <laughs> I had him on out of complete desperation one day. Yes. I can assure you, man. I, I still remember the scene there, this uh, pathetic guy with a pamphlet. Well, he looked pretty distinguished. And then we flew with him uh, to one of the Super Bowl sites. We were on a flight out of Miami. Yeah, yeah. Or somewhere, or uh, he, he was on our plane, and uh, we, we had a, you know spent a long time talking to him. He's a very nice guy. Yeah, yeah. Here's a trivia question for you, though. True or false? 
Did uh, and and I forget his first name, uh, Nowitzki, uh, the uh, doctor that's always uh, you know screaming about how the NFL is dead wrong and he's cases and African American guy. You mean um 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 a um, 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 or whatever? No, no, Nowitzki, uh, the guy, uh, that, yeah, okay. the doctor. I, I forgot his first name, but uh, Chris? Uh, and, Chris? is it Chris? It might be. I feel like it's Chris. All right, true or false? Chris yes. Nowitzki, if his name is Chris, uh, true or false? Was once a wrestler in the WWE. Oh my God, that would be funny if that's true. Is that true? true? Yeah. Oh my God. So I think he wrestled briefly in the uh, World Wrestling uh, Entertainment. Uh, I mean, he he was one of those guys that uh, while concussed was uh, getting up off the mat and saying McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> there was a horse the other day. It was uh, named McMahon, but it was M C M A N. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, it uh, could have been named for some guy named McManus or whatever. Uh, who the hell knows? Some Irishman that's uh, you know, slugging down uh, a couple of uh, dark beers somewhere in a pub uh, in uh, Dublin. And, um, you know, and, and watching uh, old fights of, uh, you know, uh, you know, so, some Irish boxer yeah, that, that was uh, campaigning in Barry McGuigan or whatever. But, uh, uh, you know, and uh, he... Uh, no, 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 and I lost my train of thought there for a second as I was fighter, no, fighter, Barry McWiggin. Um, I, 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 you lost me. <laughs> yeah, I know, I lost I myself. I resonated with Nowinski, <laughs> and it is Chris, by the way. Chris, Chris Nowinski, yeah. Nowinski. Is it, oh, yeah, yeah, the horse was named McMahon. Okay. And I thought the uh, track announcer. And thank you for bringing me back there, Louis. Because uh, right. uh, <laughs> he kind of lost out. me. <laughs> uh, what the fuck is he talking about? Okay, don't lose it again. But, but wouldn't the track announcer every time? Yeah. And the horse was last throughout the race, throughout yeah. the race. I, I I don't know anything about the horse. I don't know what track it was. But if you were the track announcer, especially if the horse was the last name that you were going to mention, would you not have gone and it's uh, so-and-so in seventh, uh, red flag in eighth, and McMahon? A hundred percent. How did he miss that, right? I mean, you're in an announcing game. That would have been great. I mean, uh, you know, because of my fantasies, of course, about being a race announcer and uh, my uh, deep-rooted interest in, in any form of stadium announcing. Just uh, yeah. always absolutely loved it. But uh, that that would have been fantastic. If he said that, that would have been a Tom Durkin thing, where about 10 times that he pronounced this horse's name, he, he always did it as, McMahon! <laughs> 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 what kind of uh, – how is McMahon not like president? If he ran, would he win? Vince McMahon, don't you he think? Uh, nice amount of votes. I mean, I mean, if Rubio could be a senator, why not Vince McMahon? All right, so many, many things on the slate today. We're going to get to them all. Uh, John Kajemi is going to join us today uh, later on uh, with Dateline Dolphins, now known as uh, – and, and confirmed by Jim Sarney that the official name of uh, John Kajemi's segment is Pigskin Playbook. John Kajemi's Pigskin Playbook. Right, so every segment has to have some kind of clever name Obviously. like that. Yes. And we will ask him to define what exactly, and, and he would know, played quarterback at Pitt, followed in the footsteps of the great Dan Marino, played yeah. professionally in Canada. I mean, does he not know what roughing the passer is? Oh, my Cause, God. Because we don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the guy causes a strip sack. Kansas City gets the ball. Not illegal. <laughs> hey, you can't do that. <laughs> I was like, what? He didn't even land. My favorite is he has the wherewithal to put his arm down. To not land on the quarterback, and the landing on the quarterback's what got the uh, penalty. So it's like even in the play, the, the defenders are now getting so smart to try and avoid these penalties. And you still, it's like, come on, man! Like, then why play? That and someone was saying, you know, you should just have in the grass. The minute a player yeah. grabs a quarterback, the play is dead. So ruin the game because you'll get rid of all the Lamar Jackson plays and Josh Allen plays. But at least you won't get these stupid ass penalties. Like it, to me, we get offense, chicks dig the long ball, fine. But you gotta have some deep. The defense has to have some shot. Or then what the hell is the point of any of it? Like I did, it's, it's amazing to me. Is what, Josh what, McDaniel uh, forever cursed <laughs> because <laughs> one and four. he thought Tim Tebow was a pro quarterback and, and actually helped him orchestrate the one Tim Tebow moment that still lingers. If you were going to have a highlight film of Tim Tebow in the pros, it would be that pass he had in the playoff game. I think it was what, Denver and Pittsburgh. The Steelers, yeah. And, and he throws a slant, and the guy takes it all the way into the end zone, even though it was like a seven-yard pass or something. And, uh, <laughs> everybody hailed him as a second <laughs> coming. <laughs> Ken Stabler. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> all game. 
<laughs> sucked. I mean, uh, look, you're ready to commit suicide watching so this guy play if you're the head coach. But what's up? I mean, this guy can't catch a break, huh? I mean, I he know. really can. Yeah. I mean, and as we said, infinitesimal is the margin of difference between success and failure in the pros. So when everybody gets all bent out of shape, oh, man, this guy sucks. I mean, even look at what happened to McDaniel last night. Team blows a 17-point lead. I mean, they're playing the Chiefs in Kansas City. Mahomes uh, finally catches fire. Uh, there were a couple of prop bets on that game that were interesting, Luby. Uh, did you know that the over-under number of catches by Travis Kelsey of uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, who, uh, you know, is outstanding. And you know that Mahomes is looking for him in almost every situation. He had four uh, touchdowns. <laughs> four touchdowns. But this is the interesting thing about that. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. over-under proposition, proposition on number of catches that Kelsey would have in a game was six and a hook. Oh, he caught seven passes. Oh, he caught seven passes. <laughs> and I, I'm reading a recommendation of this guy. Uh, again, uh, I hope he's no relation to Joe Cassell, a guy named Tom Cassell who's handicapping in a post for Action Sports. Mm -hmm. and, and like I always tell you, brilliant logic. I mean, you're reading this stuff. You're going, man, this guy knows way more shit than I do. Right? I mean, I'm watching games, but uh, I don't have this kind of detail. And, uh, you know, they break it down in sabermetrics and percentages, and they go back to 1860. And, uh, you know, you're looking at a picture of Jim Thorpe. And that's how he's establishing his theory about how to bet this over-under proposition. So the over-under prop on the number of yards that uh, Kelsey would have in a ball game was 70 and a hook, mm. which in uh, two of the games so far this season, I guess, he has had 70-plus uh, yards. And uh, what was this? Uh, this was week number five. So uh, yeah. two of the four games, he had eclipsed 70. It's a 50-50 proposition. There's a good chance with the Raiders' crummy secondary that uh, Mahomes is going to take I advantage of this. <laughs> and uh, he was easily going to eclipse 70 yards in his ball. Oh, my God. That's crazy. Seven catches. So yeah. whoever bet that has the over on six and a hook. The 70 and a half yards you'd figure was a natural average in 10 yards a catch. It's Kelsey, right? He's going to break yeah. one for 60. Yeah. You know, I mean, catch a five-yard pass from Mahomes at the six-yard line at his own six, break three tackles, crazy, then man. steamroll his way through 100 guys and somehow with 10 guys on his back. <laughs> yeah, Travis Kelsey, yes. He's uh, going to get, uh, you know, uh, horse-collared uh, as he lands in the end zone. Right? When you see his four touchdowns, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ends up with 24 yards in receptions. <laughs> the guy gets buried. How is that even a thing? <laughs> Scores four touchdowns. The fantasy players are creaming in their pants. Oh, my God. He, uh, you know, has seven catches. So uh, the over players on that proposition bet they're dancing in the streets. Yep. And, and the poor schmuck that had this brilliant logic about the Raiders secondary and all of this analytics ends up getting clobbered, man, losing by 50 yards to the uh, yardage proposition that he recommended so highly that we all go ahead and plunge on. That's by the crazy. way, the other handicapper on that page told you to take the Chiefs and lay the points. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so everybody is trying to bury America. Putin doesn't have to do a thing. He just needs to turn everybody over to FanDuel accounts. Honestly. It's amazing, right? Draft the Chiefs had the push, but he went for two, and he missed it, obviously. So they went up seven? Is that what it was? Or did well, he... What happened was uh, they were up seven, so they had to push yeah. accomplish, right? They kicked the extra point. You're sitting there thinking, okay, good. I'm up eight. Yeah. And now uh, by doing the math and situational uh, you know, analysis, you're sitting there thinking, well, the Raiders are very unlikely to want to kick a field goal. I mean, they're going to go for fourth downs if they're in Kansas City territory because they need a touchdown and a two-point conversion yeah. to tie the game. Andy Reid, you fat fuck. What are you <laughs> thinking? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Be honest out there, people. How many of you were thinking, Andy Reid, you fat fuck? <laughs> Just cover the point that. spread. Just don't get cute. Yeah, okay, so. So you're up nine. All okay. right, so now they would need to score on two occasions, but, uh, you know, the likelihood they were going to get a touchdown and a two point conversion to tie the game was slim and none anyway. Not none, yeah. but. The worst case scenario is you kick this extra point, you appease the betters that are laying seven, and uh, at the worst, you, they tie you up at the end of the ball game if they pull off a miracle. Thanks, Andy, for thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> that should be part of any coaching clinic that they nice. have with the NFL when the NFL sends their guys out there to tell all the coaches, this is what we want to see, guys. Yeah. All right, so um, then, I mean, in an equally bizarre move, I, I, and I, I've, 
I found this highly questionable, if you will, with apologies to uh, Dan Levitard, who had the uh, show there uh, by that title. But but it certainly uh, loomed as highly questionable. Uh, Josh McDaniel going for two with four minutes to go, down one in the game. And, uh, you know, having survived this, uh, you know, huge, I mean, just uh, baffling comeback by the Kansas City Chiefs, they were unable to answer back. They had 17 points at the half and I think 23 uh, late in the fourth quarter. So now it's 30 to 29, Luby, and they go for two with four minutes to go. Oh, what do you think about that move? Yeah. So, okay. So read, because that's what the score looks like. I just wasn't sure. So read one for two, missed it. They're up seven. Right. You're like, I find they'll at least tie it. And then whatever, you go to OT, worst case, they score a touchdown. McDaniels, like, look, McDaniels, he's McDaniels. He's McDaniels, like, yeah. we're one and three on the road. Let's just go for it to try and win like it's Nebraska in the 80s um, or something? I think, you know, the, the uh, logic there would have been uh, Mahomes is going to have four minutes to go. And the likelihood is, uh, you know, he, he's, uh, you know, uh, going to bury us anyway. So why don't we at least try to take the lead right here? So there was time uh, left. because I saw, Oh, I plenty did, of time. Yeah, there was, there was like oh, almost five minutes left in the game at that point. Oh, oh so you assume they're going to score anyway, so you might as well have a lead. To uh, lean on. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, wouldn't you want to be in a tie I, situation? So whatever they do, you have a chance to match it? Of course. You're talking, I, and I sound like a hypocrite because sometimes I'll say be aggressive, but to me, there's certain times where it's like, like Bobby, we talked with Bobby when I was with the guys doing that Land show where we got that clip from. And yeah. when we had Andrews and talking CD, Bobby about and Bobby, we talked about that. The, uh, what the, what is it? The choke at the dope when the Gators were up like 30 yeah. and, and the Knowles came all the way back and they had a chance to win and Bobby and they had twos and Bobby's like, look, my kids have done so much to get there. Yeah. I just wanted to give them the tie. I just wanted to give them the tie so that they had something. Again, that was the end of the game, but he took the tie because it was like, if they lose, that's the flame to do all that to then lose. And I took that to heart. To me, it's like, at least have the tie because it gives the defense some lift. Once you miss it, now there's the Chiefs just have to run the clock out, which to, get the, to stop the Chiefs from running the clock out must be fucking impossible. Well, and, and they did. They did manage to do that. Uh, they stopped the Chiefs at midfield. Uh, Chiefs were up one. Uh, they didn't really have any incentive, you know, overwhelming incentive to score, except that there was enough time left that uh, if they had any kind of a drive, they probably were going to be knocking on the door uh, of at least a field goal try. So uh, he puts them in a very compromising situation. Now, they missed it by the, uh, such a small margin. I, I have to yeah. say this, that uh, the official that made the call uh, really, I mean, did, did an incredible job because, okay. I mean, you would have needed an electron microscope to see the differential between uh, where the ball was when the guy's knee hit the ground and the goal line, which he eventually oh. pushed the ball over when he stretched out. But uh, the truth was the guy made the right call on the field. Uh, an incredible validation of the fact that the refs aren't totally bozoic, even though know, <laughs> you're watching these pass interference calls. And, and, and how do you get a defensive holding call on a field goal try? That's, That's impossible. <laughs> Who throws a flag there? Those are my favorite calls, the ones that you don't understand A defensive at all. <laughs> holding call. What, what is the offensive line doing? Everybody is blocking and peeling back. Or maybe, yeah. you know, uh, leaning forward and, and into you to keep you from, uh, you know, jumping up and, and blocking a field goal. But th this was on the outside, completely inconsequential. And uh, the guy, I mean, uh, on, on what was a missed field goal try by Kansas City, uh, throws a flag for holding and, and gives Kansas City the ball back and they eventually go in for the go-ahead touchdown. Sometimes he drafts. I, think, God, I don't know. That's insane. <laughs> Let him play. <laughs> like, I don't... I don't I, I don't understand. I don't want people killing each other. I get it, but come on. Like, that's a stupid ass flag. Uh, there, you know, there's going to be, I mean, you talk about worrying about a civil war over the January 6th thing. It's going to happen between betters and NFL officials. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It, it, this has just exacerbated this whole relationship and, uh, you know, escalation of interest in gambling where, I mean, how would I even know that these prop bets were available? Travis Kelsey to go over 70 and a half yards. And you're sitting there uh, literally as if he was finding, uh, you know, uh, the final details of a cure for cancer and detailing them in, uh, you know, some medical report. The guy details why Kelsey is going to go over 70 and a hook. He should have. Ends up at 24 <laughs> yards. But on seven catches with four touchdowns. That's you know how you sometimes peel it back because you want to see if you got the numbers. You just peel it yeah, back yeah. slowly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, or you're thinking, uh, well, what, what, what is this check for? What did this guy give me? Is it a thousand? <laughs> a hundred? Right? <laughs> you owe me a dime. Where's the rest of it, Joe? 
But you peel it back slowly because you know the guys are stiff. Right? You, you know it's not there, but you're hoping. <laughs> so this guy probably wakes up this morning and looks at the stats. So whoever pounded this on the suggestion of Tom Casale uh, out of the New York Post and Action Sports and uh, sees <laughs> seven catches. Oh, four, four touchdowns. Times. One of them had to be a long one. 23 yards. <laughs> 25 yards? You're, you're calling the, the publisher of wherever you got this information from and saying, hey, what the hell is wrong with your printer? <laughs> That's what I just thought. I'm like, I, I, I woke up re and I read an article that said he had four TDs and then you said the seven touch. I'm like, damn, he must have like 150 yards. And then I'm like, 25. <laughs> it was like impossible. I don't even know if he had 25. It's it might have been like 23. It said 25 there. It might be 25. It was the weirdest stat I've ever seen. I mean, not the weirdest necessarily, that's but crazy ass that line. Like, very that's like unusual. A, that's yes. like the Tom Rathbun who would have like three touchdowns in like two and a half yards. <laughs> Pete Johnson. Remember Pete Johnson? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He would have four carries for three yards and three touchdowns. <laughs> exactly. It's like, what the fuck? Shul only rolled him in there. He was like 300 pounds at the time. Remember, he was a dynamite back with, uh, what, Cincinnati Bengals he played most of his career with? And yes. uh, he was with the Dolphins there briefly as a human battering ram. Yep. And uh, they would just hand him the ball there like it was Fridge Perry and put him right over the pile. <laughs> Stop this. <laughs> All right. Uh, Hylia Park. What, what a great place. I mean, if you want to go to a place that's not uh, taking that's you uh, over the, you know, calls uh, and, and just using their ability to uh, take advantage of the state's legislation of the rake. I mean, <laughs> they have tweaked these machines up so that you win. And, yep. you know. That's why you, you see a big difference. I mean, I, I walked into, uh, you know, a casino the other day here. You'll find that surprising. Uh, the local <laughs> one. And I like to scan because I, I love casino face. I, I just do. I, I love seeing it on different people where, you know, that it, it, these machines are just sucking the 20s out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. It's either a stick or a 20, too. There are no other denominations. Nobody puts a five into a slot machine. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What do you start with? I got a hundred dollar voucher here. All right, very good. Um, but at Hylia Park, they're winning, man. I mean, they're dancing in the streets. This place dead, man. Uh, like walking into a morgue. You would have thought the queen died or something. I mean, uh, and I'm looking around. I'm going, is anybody winning here? And, and the answer is probably no. But uh, Hylia Park, they're winning jackpots all the time because Steve Calibro knows how to run a casino. They know how to treat their people, and uh, you're going to have a good time there. And, and that always uh, promotes uh, a very good vibe, does it not, Luby? If you feel like, if you just yeah, feel like you're in there with a chance to win, you need a chance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not like they're passing you a little vial of cyanide you know, no. as soon as you sign up for your player's card, like they do in some casinos as well. Which way would you like to go? Would you like the hemlock or the cyanide? I guess <laughs> hemlock is old school. That's like Socrates. <laughs> Pass the wine, which, please. Which way would you like to go? <laughs> <laughs> Give me your choice. <laughs> At Highland Park, you get a player's card, man. You're, you're, you're like, all of a sudden the Queen of Sheba, man. It, it, it's just unbelievable. Uh, all of the uh, generous rewards that they have, uh, the freebies they give you, free play, all kinds of stuff, uh, bargains on food, which are already a bargain. Mike Mayo on the lunchbox. I guess he was at the Hard Rock last night. Man, this guy's a sick degenerate. He uh, is. It's yeah. crazy. Like, he, he's so what he, people think you are. He, yeah. he really is. Like, they think he's not, and you are, and it's the opposite. Right. You dabble. He does these benders. <laughs> oh, he's like uh, Matt Damon in Rounders. Like, you know, when you're there at three in the morning, you need something to eat. I'm like, no, I don't know that. I don't. I've never done that. <laughs> never. He, he, he's at a casino and he gets a bowl of soup, 19 bucks, which was no complaint. And gets whacked for five dollars for a seltzer. I could have got a water and it probably would have been free. Right. Or uh, would they have charged you for that also? I but uh, here's Mayo always complaining about the people who fetch about pricing. On Let's Eat South Florida, 90,000 strong. And, and what is he complaining about? Pricing. Pricing. <laughs> <laughs> and the people are coming back. Oh, Mayor, you paid 19 bucks for a bowl of soup. <laughs> what did you think it was going to be? <laughs> <laughs> soup. He said, well, it was a meal. Yeah, right. Thank God for Hylia. But you don't have that problem in Hylia Park. Like, you really oh, don't. I mean, because <laughs> you're almost stunned. Like, that's it? You know, what you, do you mean? You get, that's literally how I felt when we went and got the Cuban sandwiches. It was yeah. the meat. It was a nice sandwich. And I'm like, oh, this must be like 10. And it was like five bucks. And I'm like, five, five bucks. bucks. Yeah. And then here comes <laughs> a, like a mountain of French fries, all perfectly. And I was like stoked. I'm like, thank God. <laughs> and they're like, what would you like to drink with that? I, and you're, you're thinking, wow, this, this is the way to go. 
I mean, uh, this is the way I want to live. So uh, you're going to love it. Not ballpark prices on the food and drink. Highly a park. That makes it an especially good time. Champion simulcasting room going to be busy. You got Keeneland going. You have all kinds of stuff. Uh, Belmont and Aqueduct. A lot of great racing. And the setup in there is unparalleled anywhere. So I've been to a couple of different places. Uh, and, uh, they, you know, they have decent uh, simulcasting setups. But uh, you wouldn't find a situation like I did the other day at a certain casino where uh, they don't even have the Dolphin game on. On any no. of the screens, they have 100 monitors, not not one showing a Dolphin game. And uh, a very cooperative person there. I mean, somebody that uh, is just great when it comes to the service, uh, you know, and especially it's got to be annoying for the workers there to want to be changing TVs all the time. Hey, could you put Monticello on? Yeah, I, I, I was at the Borscht Belt there. Um, <laughs> yeah, some old geezer. It's not even betting. He's not drinking nothing. He's demanding exactly. television channel changes. But uh uh, you know, and, and they, they ultimately said, they finally got it, but originally it was stated, we can't get that station. What does that mean? Like, what? Eh, it's, it's a local <laughs> station. <laughs> Never a problem like that at Hylia Park. That's so nice. uh, they, they aim to please there. That's what it's all about. Open till uh, 3 a.m. on the weeknights and 5 a.m. on the uh, weekends. It's beautiful. Hylia Park. All right, we're coming back with more. John and Jimmy going to join us in a short order. We love talking to John. And uh, we'll get into a lot of different things, including uh, the, these calls. Uh, would he not appreciate what a roughing the passer call is? Oh, my God. Now? Are you kidding me? Being a quarterback? It's got to be the, the dream. The quarterbacks in the day, though, they would have been arguing with the officials even after getting annihilated and getting the benefit of the flag instead of Riley smiling as they got up. Like Joe Cap would go and attack the official and say, what do you think I am? Some pussy? <laughs> eh? That wasn't roughing. That was nothing. <laughs> Sonny Jurgensen, man. <laughs> you call that roughing? I'll give you a roughing. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll get into a lot of stuff with uh, Jack and Jimmy, college football and the pros, and uh, many other things. As uh, we continue here on the Defoe Show, Jeff DeForest, Mike Luby, Lubitz, a lot of good stuff happening on the chat line here. So I'm going to take a look at that, and uh, we'll be back with more uh, in a moment. Now that. The time. I'm not sure Andy was completely right about that tax break and the certain <laughs> very friendly leniency that was uh, being uh, exhibited and passed along to uh, us poor paying uh, slobs by the IRS here in Florida. It is uh, 7.58. Folks, Tony Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously. Friendly atmosphere, not too loud, but good energy, reasonable prices, and a place where you feel comfortable. All those ingredients, no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes. Really, really good food, amazing atmosphere, good for a family, good for a date, or just a night out for yourself, and prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched, steaks hand cut every day, everything, and I mean everything is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low-carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305-453-9066. The reason we realize it's not just hurricane season that can hurt us. Any time of year, things can happen to your home or business. And the insurance company can be your friend, but they also can be your enemy. Horizon Public Adjusters, Justina Testa, are here for you to help this process go so much easier. Before you call the insurance company, call Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa at 954-809-8752. Would you go into court without an attorney? So why would you go up against an insurance company without Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa? Seven to ten times more money recovered with a public adjuster than if you went on your own. If there's no recovery, there's no fee, give them a call at 954 809 8752. Why go up against insurance companies alone when you can have Horizon Public Adjusters and Justina Testa on your side? State Line Dolphins with John Jemmy, and that's brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill in the Keys, and we're looking very much forward to doing some broadcasts there. I think we're going to head down there like once a month during the football season. I have to ask you this, on you know, and feel free to you know, not necessarily spill the beans uh, from a personal standpoint to your good friend Dan Marino. Does he experience or did he ever experience nightmares 
about handing the ball off to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at that one year when Jimmy <laughs> insisted on running the ball on every play. And uh, it, it was always, I mean, uh, the announcer, I think it was Ron St. John was a stadium announcer back then, and you could hear him say, hand off to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, gain of one, second and nine. Hand off to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, gain of one, third and eight. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, ever talk about that? Remember, no, he's never days. really talked about that, Defoe. But you're right. I think they did have that on loop at whatever the stadium was called. At that yeah, time. it was one yard every time. And it was a generous one yard they were giving him statistically. Enjoy your trip to work with lots of laughs, thanks to Defoe and Luby. Now on the Defoe Show. Roughing the passer, 15 yards. On number 79. Uh, oh, wow. Look how good this kid looks today. Uh, unbelievable. Welcome back to the show, the Depot Show here. On a fine Tuesday, usually uh, John and Jimmy joins us on Mondays, and uh, we have uh, renamed the segment John and Jimmy's Pigskin Playbook, uh, formerly known as uh, what? It, it could have been Dolphin Digest, but we would have stolen that. Uh, and it was uh, Dateline Dolphins. Because you have to have alliteration if you're going to do this sort of thing. Uh, but um, I, I saw you on TV all weekend, John, and uh, you were looking great outdressing the rest of the guys on the set by a mile. And uh, you look terrific today, uh, my friend. How are you? Good to have you on the show. I'm doing fine. I'm great, Defoe and Luby. Uh, glad to join you guys again. And, uh, yeah, exciting weekend if if you're a quarterback because you you seem like you got away with a lot and your team was uh, – uh, no penalties on the offense, a lot of penalties on the defense. And uh, that the roughing the passers, that, that's at the top of everybody's uh, – uh, of discussion, topic of discussion for, you know, sitting around having a coffee or, you know, throwing a beer at a, you know, a bar. <laughs> you just got to, you had to go crazy watching games this weekend because you couldn't keep up with where the officials and where the rules and where the, the, the gray matter was in there because it seemed like everything favored the quarterback and nothing favored the, the defensive line or linebacker or corner, or whoever was coming in on a blitz. Is everybody in Kansas City, by the way, I'm sure you've been there in your travels, uh, you know, uh, over the years playing football and announcing. Is everybody fatter than Andy Reid in the crowd? I mean, uh, that, that's a heavy crowd. I mean, in terms – they talk about the Cleveland guys being slobs in the dog pound, but uh, wow, what, what a bunch of fat people they have in Kansas City. Did you notice that last night? I did. I, you know what? I, that didn't that didn't cross my <laughs> mind immediately. But, Everybody's a thousand know, pounds. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> I don't know if they get the Nutrisystem commercials out oh there. Oh, my God. Really, sure. Did you ever try this stuff? No, I don't want to, uh, you know. No. Uh, let's... Cast aspersions on, uh, you know. <laughs> diet that obviously worked for, for, for Danny Boy all of those years. I mean, it, it was like the Brady diet at the time. I mean, just as effective. He could have played till he was 50. If it wasn't for the, uh, you know, the, the knees and the Achilles. But uh, all right. So so we're more confused than ever, uh, John Kajemi. Uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, what should the protocol be for concussions and what exactly is roughing the passer? Roughing the passer, if you're Tom Brady, is uh, anybody gets within uh, three feet of you and, uh, you know, uh, breathes in your direction. Uh, roughing the passer, I mean, uh, this thing with Derek Carr last night, uh, that, that was that was unreal. Uh, it's a strip sack. Uh, how do you have a roughing the passer call? All of those fat slobs that were throwing barbecue ribs at, uh, you know, the officials down on the field. Uh, they had every reason, I think, to bitch on, on that one. And, and then, you know, guys, I, I was watching a crawl, and like 100 guys are in concussion protocol now. I don't think yeah. anybody's going to play next week uh, in <clears> the <throat> league. Gonna be, it, <laughs> it's going to be tough. You're right. You're, it, it's exactly Honestly, it, the quarterback position, obviously. They're trying to protect quarterbacks. I understand that. We've all been through that, you know, for the past 10, 15 years. But there's got to be a point where football has to be football or it's not – it's not what the rules and not what the game that you grew up with. Right. I, I know things need to evolve. I, I know analytics are a big part of offense now. Like I thought it was ridiculous for the Raiders, not just to kick the extra point. Oh my God. And, and, and feel like when you're sitting on the bench and you're Derek Carr and you look up and you go, all right, 30, 30, we're okay. we got four minutes left. We fought our way back. It's a tough place to play. You fight your way back. You look up and you go, Oh, it's 30, 29. We're still short. We, we, what are we going to do? Yeah. And, and it's, it's demoralizing. So the analytics aside, uh, roughing the passer, the, the call last night, the ball, it's a fumble, right? Yes. The, the ball's out. It's I was strip, shocked. Strip sack, yeah. fumble. And, you know, whether, whether he lands on, on Derek Carr and pummels him or tries to brace himself, 
the fact of the play was it was a it was a strip sack fumble turnover ball goes the other way <laughs> and, if, and if you have to call a penalty for lumping on a quarterback and jumping on him do it have an asterisk somewhere else because that's not part of the play right it's not no. it's not part of the football play. it's a natural consequence uh you know yeah. after the play's already been decided and, and right it, dramatically and the, one with brady, the other way guys the one yeah. with brady you know i'm sure tom brady was laughing after the game yeah because well, they were they supposed to put an air mattress under Brady before they, they tackle the guy? <laughs> yeah, I, I saw somebody on Twitter the other. Uh, I guess it was yesterday. They were laying somebody on a pillow, and then yeah. they're getting their legs up. And you know, I, the the problem is the Queen's burial wasn't any softer than this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they're doing, Defoe? Yeah. They're, they're continuing to change the rule every time somebody does something. So yeah. it, it's you know you can't land on them. And you can first. You can't go with their legs, you know, underneath the knees and you know yeah. by the ankles. Okay, then you got to take the head out of it. Well, yeah. they want you to to wrap and roll. So guys are wrapping and rolling, but they're wrapping and rolling, and oh. you know you've got a yeah. three hundred and twenty pound lineman with a quarterback, and he's ragdolling him, so he looks like he's getting thrown and whipped to the ground. Sometimes that happens in football, and sometimes it doesn't. But I don't know how you're supposed to tell the defensive lineman or defensive end or rush linebacker that when you get there these are the rules you have to follow you know there, there's protocol to, to yeah. sacking the quarterback now and, and it's arbitrary i mean uh, the calls have been so inconsistent and, and uh, even worse i mean some of the stuff that you're seeing with pass interference which has always been i mean uh, you know a common and bitter complaint of fans yeah. forever and i would imagine people in the game uh, but, but, you know, I, I always, I mean, I'm going back to playing touch football in the streets uh, in New York, uh, uh, face guarding was, was never permissible. Never. I mean, you know, and, and the rule was very simple. Uh, you know, if you haven't got your head even twisted slightly, you are face guarding if you're just running into, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a possible receiver. Uh, and, and we're seeing this. And, and then the guy makes contact as the receiver's going up for the ball who's facing the quarterback. And that no call on some, and then you're watching a guy on the other side of the field barely get grazed, and they're throwing pass interference and holding calls and, and, and changing the entire dynamic of the game. The pass rush has gotten so good, and the, and the athletes that are rushing the quarterback are so good that you see more underthrown balls than you see overthrows. Yeah. So yeah. the receivers are looking, you know, obviously they have their head turned and trying to locate the football. With all the speed in the game, the defensive backs are just running as fast as they can to try to keep up with the wide receiver. When he hits the brakes and you're going 100 miles an hour as a defender, there's going to be a natural collision. I, I agree. If, if that collision happens when the, the defensive back is trying to turn and make a play on the football, then it, it shouldn't be pass interference unless he's holding the receiver's arms or hands or, you know, or blocks, you know, himself into him, which alters the pass receiver's ability to catch the football. Uh, there's a lot of intangibles to it, but at the end of the day, the, they're caused by speed of the game and not being able to locate the football as a defender because he's going 100 miles an hour trying to get Tyreek Hill or Devontae Adams, the guys that can fly, because if that ball's on the money and he's beat, the coach is going to say, why didn't you – pass interference would have been better than yeah. giving up the touchdown. Yeah. So it's, it's it, it becomes blatant too. There. Like you said, uh, with, with the balls falling short and, and the receivers sort of uh, not necessarily coming back to the ball, but going up in the air to try and uh, leap over a guy and make a catch. And then when that well, defender crashes into him and he's running directly at him uh, with his uh, back turned to the quarterback and his head not turned around, it's so blatant. I don't know how that isn't a flag every time, and yet it isn't. I know, and, and I'm sure that the wide receiver coaches are teaching these guys. Listen, yeah. when, you, when you've when you got the defender there and you know you've beaten him but the ball's underthrown, just reach over his shoulders, act like you're trying to catch the football. You know you can't get it, yeah. but you're going to get the P.I. nine times out of ten. You know, Devontae Adams won early in the game. Was I was like, really? are you really? Like the defender wasn't holding him. He wasn't grabbing no. him. He didn't have time to turn around because the ball was five yards short. Like the ball right. fell before him. I'm right. like – but Adams did this, uh, like, oh, I tried. I see, I couldn't get to it. No one can get to it. The he looked like Danny Ainge. Short. Yeah. That's the other question <laughs> I have. I know default goes the other way because it involves his bet. So he wants pass interference all the time. What happened to uncatchable? 
Was that? I don't you know if they. Yeah. I don't know if they threw that out. I. I didn't keep. Somebody asked me that the other day, and I was like, "Yeah, year. I haven't. I haven't seen that signal in a long they time. They the must time. have thrown that away because they don't call it. One. One of the passes to Devonte Adams on the sidelines was out of bounds. What? Yeah, it yeah, was you know a couple yeah. rows back, and they you know he got the call. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that play and thinking, wait a minute, man. Nobody in their right mind could think this guy could have caught the ball inbounds. <laughs> right. It's in the stands. And, uh, you know, and, and yet they gave him the call. All right. Uh, we could bitch about calls all day. I just think it's it's going to lead. You know, they talk about the Civil War and, you know, there was going to be a race war or, you know, and who knows what with the Trumpster. I mean, anything can happen if he comes back as president. But I believe the next Civil War will be between betters and NFL officials. <laughs> and, and, and because of the escalation and uh, the amount of money that is now being sent in by everybody, young and old, it's not just the old geezers that have a, mm-hmm. a private bet on a game anymore. You got young kids, you know, 12 year olds with 12 team parlays. <laughs> 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 prop bets. I, I couldn't believe these wild prop bets. I mean, can you imagine the poor schmuck that lost the yardage prop bet by like 50 yards on Travis Kelsey last night, who had four touchdowns yeah. and seven catches? And 25 like yards. Like 24 yards, yeah, something like that, right? <laughs> now, I, you know, and the other thing, I just said uh, for a second, get back to this whole officiating thing. Uh, you know, you were always involved, I would imagine, in some form of organized football, John. But uh, yes. no doubt you played your, you know, share of Sandlot ball where you made your own calls. Right. Can you imagine trying to, uh, you know, decipher, you know, there was always that one asshole that called everything. You know, <laughs> wow. hey, hey, it's penalty, penalty, penalty. Yeah. it's holding, it's holding, it's holding, it's Imagine today with today's complicated rules where, where nobody understands what's what. <laughs> having having to deal with a clown like that while you're just out there trying to play like the Kennedys, a little game of football in the yard. That was the kid you used to he used to play defensive back and he'd always, you know, call offensive pass interference yeah. or something. So you would just tell your receiver to run down the field and about ten yards, fifteen yards, you try to drill him in the back of the head because he wasn't looking. Yeah, that was and you kid. were capable was, of doing that. That was the kid. <laughs> He pushed me. I was like, yeah, shut up, Johnny. <laughs> it's big up football. After a while, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, but I, I believe that this is going to escalate possibly into a, a very troubling uh, spot for the country if, if these calls continue to be as vague and inconsistent. And and who knows? Who's eligible to play, John? I mean, uh, you're following the Dolphins very closely. Tua? Well, what's up with him, man? Has anybody seen him around here anymore? Uh Evidently, you got uh, Teddy Bridgewater. Yeah. Uh, he was fine, apparently. I don't know. He was in better shape than uh, you, I, and uh, you know you, you, me, and Luby. And uh, right. And and you know yet I don't know. Is he out next week? And, and then right now, uh, you know, in protocol. We end up with the Skylar Thompson, who unfortunately, you know, uh, the, the lights all of a sudden came on, and, and like the show's on now. The audience is there. They all paid their money. They want to see something great, even though you nailed the rehearsal. Uh, it's not that easy for a guy, right? You know, to come in there and, and perform in a situation like like he was asked to do on the road against, I don't know, have we underrated the New York Jets? I mean, uh, uh, what do you think? You know, it, it was a tough spot for Scott because it happened on the first offensive play for the Dolphins. And yeah. you're, you're kind of getting – normally you're getting into a rhythm of a game when you're a backup quarterback on the sidelines because you're hearing the plays called, you're looking at the defense – you're seeing what's executed on the field and you go, oh, I would have probably went here with the football or, you know, I might have I might have killed that play and went to another play here because I like that better than what maybe Teddy did. You don't get those opportunities to have those mental reps like you did at practice all week on the sidelines when, you know, your quarterback, the starter goes out on the first offensive play. So now you're kind of thrown in there. And, you know, I, I thought he did pretty well for for the situation on the road and and a team that probably changed a little bit defensively from what you thought you might see because you're in the game and you don't have any reps and you're going to probably have a lot more, you know, different disguising defenses or different blitzes or different formations you'll see in different coverages. I thought he did fairly well and he'll only get better from there. But the concussion thing back to your original point, yeah. guys. So, um, so what happens there? I, I, mean, I think, I think Tua is still in concussion protocol He's not eligible right now since you're in that for any type of football activities. Teddy Bridgewater, the earliest he can come back out of concussion protocol is Thursday, and that involves no pads, no contact, no anything. Okay. So now it looks like Skylar Thompson might be up again. But in in my opinion, I, I'm trying to figure out if Tua Tungavailoa passed all of 
the test that he was put through for the past two weeks, starting from the Buffalo game yeah. onto the concussion in Cincinnati on a short week. By my count, it's going to be 13 or 14 days when the Dolphins finally do resume practice on Wednesday. He's passed everything else, but yet he's still in concussion protocol and not allowed to participate. I don't understand. That's a long time uh, for him not to, you know, have any symptoms or, you know, be able to go to, to the training staff and go, listen, guys, I'm fine. I know I was really messed up on Thursday night, but I passed all those tests. They let me fly back on the plane. It's been nearly two weeks now. I want to play. I want to get out of this pro concussion protocol since I've passed all the tests that you're telling me that I need to pass to be eligible to play. And it's part of my obligation to play. I mean, as you're signing up for the National Football League, you're signing a contract, you're getting paid a lot of money. Yeah. Um, if you say that you're okay, and I know that the rules and all the, the medical staff are there to protect you from yourself, mm -hmm. but at one point, at what point do you say, well, what, else, what other tests can we give him to make him stay in protocol because he's passing everything. Well, that's the dilemma with this whole thing is, and Mike McGee is the one thing I took from that presser right after that. A lot of people, a lot of ex NFL players thought was phony. It wasn't. I thought he was being legitimate. And when he said, look, who am I to go against the doctors? If I go against the doctors, then when does he play again? And here we are. Yeah. He's passing everything. It will be two and a half weeks because they start playing on Thursday. But it's still too soon. Okay, when isn't it too soon? Like, if you're not listening to the doctors, who tells you when he can play? Yeah, and it'd be different if if reports came out and said, you know what, Tua is still probably sensitive to light. You know, he goes outside and he's doesn't feel right, or he feels lightheaded, or you know, wh whatever the case may be, yeah, right? Um, yeah. But it, from all indications, now I haven't spoke to Tua, so I can't say. Yeah, Tua said, bang, you know, X Y Z. I heard he was uh, speaking in Hebrew. I, mean, I don't know if that's any indicator. Yeah, but, uh, his last press yeah. conference, he started with uh, Shema Yisrael. <laughs> hey, somebody I, I don't mean to laugh fine. about it. I told yeah. you, he's fine. Listen to exactly. him. Believe me, I, uh, I've known many boxers, uh, you know, that uh, ended up uh, with, you know, various forms of dementia just because uh, uh, they obviously had been concussed many times right. uh, during their career. I needed an interpreter. Uh, I had Joe Frazier on a show uh, many, many years ago. I came into the studio at WIOD, did an hour with me, and uh, if he didn't bring his son Marvis, we would have had no idea what he was talking about. Right. He may as well have been Roberto Duran speaking in Spanish. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I, I've seen it, and I don't mean to make light of it. I, I just, it's become so vague, and, and, and particularly in this case, because uh, you're getting really no input as to uh, what, what, well, what this guy's availability is, and yet everybody's saying he's fine. So uh, and I, I totally where does that leave you? I, I totally agree with the medical staff. If they evaluate X, Y, Z player and say, you know what? I still think that he's not right. Or he, you know, he did this. I know this guy and I gave him this test last year and now I'm giving him this test now. And it's not, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, really mesh with what I would remember. Okay, fine. But th the other side of that coin is now you're going to have a spotter that's sitting up in the press box. That's going to tell me, I saw Teddy Bridgewater stumble and Teddy Bridgewater is walking to the, you know, to the locker room going, who's the cat that's telling me I can't play? I'm fine. You know, <laughs> yeah. I didn't stumble. This is the, you know, I'm, I'm walking normal. I feel normal. Now we're at the mercy of a guy that's, you know, all the way up in the stands when you have the medical staff right there and they go through the protocols in, in the locker room when you take him to the, to the locker room and they come out and go, he's okay. I think he's, I think he's fine. His elbow's a little hurt, but. You know, he, he he's, can play. He wants to play. He passed all the tests we gave him. But the, the spotter is going to start taking people out of the game. Now, the spotter is a huge Jet fan. Uh, well, that's he, came, you know, he lives in Brooklyn. <laughs> and, you know, like, well, well, what do you, uh, how do you know who the spotter is? Yeah. Uh, you know, integrity uh, of the league is always, uh, you know, going to be an issue, especially with uh, all of this uh, interest in gambling and the league's own interest. Uh, in it, and, and yet uh, this has become uh, very, very vague. And, and, and you know, I, I think you're, you're in agreement with me and most people that uh, unfortunately uh, you can't mediate or legislate all of the risks of the game out of the game because <clears throat> by its very nature, it, it's a violent sport. Uh, you know, yeah. much like boxing uh, is or MMA. I mean, uh, 
you know, if you sign up for it, like you said, you kind of find it, you know, is inherent with the job that there's a possibility, you know, maybe even something catastrophic could happen. And, and, and sometimes does. It was very, very sad. But I mean, you don't want this to be commonplace where every quarterback or every player, for that matter, is running around. I mean, the, the issue seems to be focused on quarterbacks. And yet, I mean, you'll see, you know, every few plays, you know, a collision of two guys with helmets, maybe even away from the ball. That uh, you know would would knock the snot out of virtually anybody and have them seeing stars for years, mm -hmm. uh, you know thereafter. But uh, no, I, I, I don't know that it's an issue that's going to be resolved in any kind of favorable fashion. It's just very curious to me. I I've, I haven't seen a, a spot like this where uh, the Dolphins' uh, starting quarterback is a complete mystery as to his status. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, it's like and 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 so vague that that you really you know don't have confidence. In the idea that, I mean, when is he coming back? I mean, is there any timetable whatsoever that, you know, well, geez, if, if this happens, then he'll, he'll be back in two weeks or something. Well, uh, and today's that's an unusual. Day. Yeah. Today's an off day. You're not going to get any news. Tomorrow will be the big day to say, hey, uh, Tua Tonga Vailoa is now officially out of protocol. Um, I'm sure that he doesn't immediately go back to practice. There's probably some steps that, you know, gradually get him back to playing. Yeah. Teddy Bridgewater is going to be the same way, I would assume, because I was I was thinking Tua was going to be released from concussion protocol after the game on Sunday. So Monday they evaluate him. They're going to come out and say he's going to be good to go to practice on Wednesday. We're going to take it day by day, but he is out of protocol. That didn't happen. So now you're looking at you know Skylar Thompson and Reed Sennett as your as your two quarterbacks. Uh, you know, guys that are going to go have to play the Minnesota Vikings at home, uh, a really good four and one football team that can score a lot of points. So it, it's going to be an uphill battle, especially with missing, you know, Armstead uh, was out of the game. X was out of the game. Byron Jones doesn't seem like he's coming back till 2023 at wow. this point. Um, you know, not really, but he should have had, he should have had, uh, surgery two months prior to when he did yeah. have it. So he was ready to go, you know, game one. Now we're going to be into game six or seven and it's going to take him a few weeks to get, cause he's a, you know, one of those linear guys. He's not a, just a, a guy that can quick twitch you to death. So he's going to take his, if he's not perfect, he's not a hundred percent. So uh, there's just a lot of things that are happening to the Miami dolphins now that at quarterback and at corner, that you're starting to, you know, and, and well, on the offensive line, you're crossing your fingers. Oh, and Hill left with, and, and we haven't talked about this, Hill left in a walking boot. Like, what is I that? Think, I think that was more precautionary. Yeah. I think he was sore. Really like and they said, you know what, let's put him in a boot. Let's take some pressure off of it. Uh, I think he's going to be okay, but you yeah. never know. we got to wait till Wednesday when that injury report comes out. What a mess, man. And the team's three and two, and they started out the season in such scintillating fashion, and now it's well, like yeah. complete, total chaos. Yeah. In my We're opinion, it's still four. on schedule, guys, because yeah. there is no chance a healthy Bills team is going to lose to the Dolphins that third game of the season. I don't believe the Dolphins took advantage of a beat-up yep. Bills team. Oh, it was great. And you trade out the Bills with the Jets win, and you're right, you're right around where, where you think you probably were going to be three and two going into Minnesota. The wise guys are thinking Skylar Thompson, I guess, because uh, the line went from uh, one favoring the uh, Miami Dolphins to uh, now the uh, Vikings being three point uh, favorites on the road. Sure. Uh, yeah. And that was sort of overnight uh, as, uh, you know, we, we've failed to get any kind of uh, insight into whether or not. Uh, imagine this, though. How great is this, uh, John Kajemi and Luby? We're screaming for Tua to come back. Yeah, but how many people realize what Tua Everybody is? wanted to run this guy out of town, man. Uh, they wanted to put it. him on a boat and send him to Havana. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And, uh, you know, now. It's like, man, how are we going to win without this guy? It's incredible. So uh, that, that represents kind of a nice turnaround by, uh, you know, the philosophies here locally. All right. Uh, if you want to turn around your philosophy and, you know, I, I was talking about uh, the fact I had this kind of joke Facebook post on, uh, you know, it just occurred to me that I was standing in front of the fridge and I was eating like I was stoned. And then I realized I was stoned. And so I, I put something to that effect up on Facebook. And, uh, and it was true. But if you wanted to eat like you were stoned, I mean, you almost have to be in a situation where, you know, you either have fasted for 24 hours because you're going to want to eat everything or maybe you, you found some kind of performance enhancing drug, if you will, because uh, the food is so great there at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill that uh, you're, you're going to want to eat a lot.
Yeah, you're going to want to go there uh, time and time again and kind of get your favorite thing and then experiment uh, because the food choices are, are so vast at, at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. I, I just, uh, it's it's a little down right now because of the, the Raider game last night with Amanda oh, yeah, and yeah. Dominic being such uh, Las Vegas Raider fans. I, I, I'd give it a day and then get <laughs> on down to Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill because uh, they'll be back up and, and in good moods and, you know, not only the food, but the service you get there. And, and Larry does such a great job running the place. Uh, it, it's a it's a great destination just to go hang out. And whether it's it's the sights and sounds of band in, in the Bayside or you want to go in the sports bar and check out, you know, playoff baseball or, or NFL football or college football on the weekends, you've got it all right there at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. I'm not sure, uh, sure how quickly, you know, we'll get a response on this, but I did put out the word to the great Tommy Fox. Yeah, to, that's what uh, I did as well. To arrange for, done, you know, the really show down there. So uh, I'm hoping that comes about. And, and then if you could possibly help me, John, could you, I mean, explain to Mike Mayo, who I think is uh, going to finally break his uh, uh, maiden there at uh, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. Uh, what exactly is comprising that Italian fisherman pizza? <laughs> and and have you ever been able to eat like a whole one by yourself? I, I, no, I can't I imagine. You just have a slice. I, I, yeah. that's have the you thing. had more than a slice? I think, I slice. I think a slice is good because it's You're got right. just about everything you want like on a. a yeah, it's it's beautiful, and, and Dominic does such a great job. You know, you, you kind of cut the pie, and you get that five pound slice, and you just lift it up and, yeah. and kind of <laughs> enjoy, right? So, uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I think Mike's gonna have a good time when he goes down. I, I want him to make one, and I'm gonna bring it to Art Basel, man. I mean, that, that thing is a work of art. I know it I is. could get like three, four hundred grand out of DiCaprio <laughs> if I brought an Italian fisherman pizza. And then the beauty the, of the art project, the art in it, is that you get to eat it. But which, uh, I mean, if that guy got like, uh, what, a couple of million for putting a banana on a canvas? Did you see that thing at Art Basel? I, uh, I last saw year that was where he taped a banana on a canvas, got like three million for that. I mean, imagine what the Italian fisherman pizza would right. bring in a situation <laughs> like that. But it brings a lot of happiness when you're down there at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. And, and we all need to get a break because. Uh, the fetching has been monumental, John Kajemi. As I'd imagine you know, uh, doing all of these Dolphin postgame and wrap-up shows that uh, you were on on CBS, which, uh, you know, I mean, I, I heard a, a lot of griping by, by Dolphin fans. I, I was, uh, you know, uh, going around and taking a little survey as to what the reaction was to the game, and, and everybody's upset. Yeah. Uh, you think that was exacerbated by the fact that it was the Jets? I, I, I don't feel that Jets-Dolphins rivalry so much. It wasn't a hatred you know? thing. It was a, yeah. No, but I think I think among the fans, you still have those bases, right? You know, the Dolphins have the the take the New York takeover where they go to their own bar and then they go to the game and yeah. they have their home two sections in the stadium at MetLife. So I think for the fans, it, it's one of their Super Bowl game days, you know, with the Jets, the Bills, New England. It, I think those rivalries still exist. Now, now, I don't know if you're still doing this, but um, in your uh, you know uh, work with the Finn Siders, uh, you're still doing like Dolphin pregame shows, are you not? Just with CBS4, yes. Oh, okay. So you're just on the yeah. tube, which is great yes. because the paycheck is way fatter. And the time, <laughs> the time involvement is less, and it's usually catered. I mean, you know, whereas, uh, you know, the radio slobs are out there. I remember you know, like schwitzing through my pants. I, I, I used to have to wear slacks to the game. Which is odd because it's you, you wouldn't even know I used to own a pair of slacks, but uh, a, a, because I was doing those on-field announcements, so I had to like right. sort of be like uh, presentably dressed, and you know, and I'm out there out front in front of the stadium there four hours before the game, and uh, and I realized that uh, you're looking at these Jet fans. The shocker was when uh, they came in with Jay Fiedler Jet jerseys on. <laughs> Remember the year the Fiedler went to the Jets from the Dolphins? Yeah. And these shiny J J Fiedler jerseys, and, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, th this this is, is the epitome of what was a bitter rivalry at one point, and, and and I loved it. And then you would see the fat guys with the T O on one side of their shirt and the O N on the other, and they were wearing like an old Al <laughs> yeah. shirt. Yeah, and I was like, you've expanded 30, 40 pounds since you were wearing that. <laughs> Get another jersey. <laughs> but, I mean, there was that feeling of disgust going back and forth between the fans. I, I, I don't know if I really felt that. It was like, okay, the Jets have been a schmanky team for a while. They might be a little bit better. Um, you know, I mean, uh, with well, the situation. How, do you, think, that, yeah, how do you think the New England fans feel about the Dolphin fans? For the past 20 years, they're, ah, 
it's the Dolphins. Right. You know, we're going to we're going to be it's the same way. Whereas when the Dolphins were king of the hill, you kind of looked down on everybody. Yep. You know, when we were growing up, because I think I think New England came down. I don't think they won in the 70s in the Orange Bowl. I don't think many teams in the AFC won in the 70s in the Orange Bowl. So you were you were kind of spoiled as a kid and as a fan base, you grew up that way. So, you know, roles reverse. I don't know if the Jets ever felt that way, but, you know, definitely New England and Dolphin fan bases probably did. I guess the rivalries in the NFC East are more traditional. But, uh, you know, and when you think back, I mean, in the heyday of the Dolphins and uh, Danny Boy Chuck and the Rock, the rivalries in the AFC East were, were also, I mean, uh, just very, very compelling. That's for sure, because uh, we hated everybody. We hated the Bills. We hated the Patriots. We hated the Jets. Yeah. Right. Indianapolis. Couldn't wait to put one probably. on them. Yeah. 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 Oh, Indianapolis. A boring team always, even with Peyton Manning. Right. I, I, the city sucks, and, and so does it. <laughs> and the Ursays are a disgrace. So we, we all know that. All, all right. Uh, you know, if you want to get over all of that and all of that fetching, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, Mile Marker 104. I don't know. That, that was uh, kind of an interesting endorsement for the place, that whole scene. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, Mile Marker 104, the Overseas Highway. I can't wait to get down there. Yes. Johnny, it's up to you, man. You talk about pressure in a quarterback. It's, it's You're going to need early pressure. Early November, then. Let's target early November. I mean, Tommy Fox. Tommy Fox. I think Tom's in concussion protocol. He'll be <laughs> out next week, so we're going to be able to we'll be able to get a hold of him. Now, now was he throwing blocks for you at, at St. Thomas yes. Aquinas? Okay. Catching passes, throwing blocks. Tommy did it all, man. Was he Travis Kelsey? I mean, uh, before Kelsey was Kelsey? Or more Bavaro? I, I think Tom was, yeah, more Bavaro, maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Mark Bavaro. Locker, very nice. Yeah. yeah. I like it, man. All right. Uh, very good. All right. We're coming back with more. We have all of this college football uh, yes. to discuss here. And, and uh, you know, we, we were saying earlier, oh. promoting your appearance here on the show, John, that as much as you do with this Miami Dolphins and all of the broadcasts and telecasts. And by the way, you were, you were kind of tucked in the shade, weren't you, when you were doing those Finsiders pregame shows? I used to see you out there with yes, the, the boys. Yes, we were. You... We were, yes. You were underneath we... with the cheerleaders and a bar right canopy. there. We had a little canopy outside, yeah. You would think a distinguished radio station like I started with, like WIOD, would have had the, <laughs> the same kind of considerations. <laughs> but we're out there in the heat. I mean... <laughs> It was brutal, man. It was absolutely brutal. You yeah. didn't see us, though, schlepping it there and putting it up ourselves. Exactly. That was the hard part. <laughs> exactly. Well, at least we didn't have to do that. You know, we just you should show up. Uh, okay, is Hank's chair clean? Okay, good. <laughs> you got the cheeseburgers he ordered? We want to make sure that, uh, you know, Hank's a happy man. Uh, we're coming back with more. Uh, the late, great Hank Goldberg. We pay tribute to him here on uh, Pigskin Playbook with John Kajemi. Uh, you know, and we also have to get into that thing about going for two because I – I thought yeah. that was insane. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm like, both times in real time, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, I literally, I, I hate to, you know, uh, keep going into some, uh, you know, uh, ugly language here, but I, 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 I literally was screaming, "You stupid fat fuck!" <laughs> when Andy Reid went for the two, and I was about to be in a spread covering position with the Chiefs laying seven. Uh, the logic behind that wasn't. I mean, it wasn't logical. And then subsequently, why is McDaniel? That there were like. What was it, like four and a half minutes left? Yeah, that, um, four and a half. Yeah, that's right. Wh what are you doing? <laughs> it's time. Uh, your like your team said, came all the way back. Yeah, you don't want to leave them back. Back. You know, you short. You look at the scoreboard and you go, we're still down. Yes. Yeah. Just tie it's it up. Because, because the Kansas City kicker almost missed two field goals yep. and, and yep. hit yeah. one off an upright. He was hard. Put the onus on them to score. And you're still going to have plenty of time to respond. I mean, even yes. if they score, because, uh, you know, right. they, they were struggling, obviously. I mean, uh, they'd scored on like five straight possessions, the Chiefs. So I, I understand that, uh, you know, may, maybe you feel like uh, you But any score was going to beat you anyway, but with right. plenty of time. So why not at least my, be in a situation my, my where, where you're going to extend the game? Yes. In case scenario, you get the OT. Where, where is the clinic on coaching, though, John? I mean, what, what has happened to the book? The book have is they, now the anal the Bible is now the analytics. The other way now, where they and they're over thinking, is, you know, what, what, I don't know. What would justify that? What analytic? I mean, uh, outside I of being a the schmuck, I mean, is that the Chiefs are going to score versus the percent the Chiefs won't. Oh score. yeah, uh -huh. but how, how are you thinking of that at that point? I mean, uh, it just uh, and and they miss it thinking, by the smallest of margins. All I was thinking was, wow, they they did nothing now for almost a quarter and a half. 
Yeah. All they got to do is kick an extra point. We're tied up with four minutes. It's a new game. But it's such a you relief. Don't have yeah. that feeling when you miss. Yeah, then it's a deflation, and now the defense, which would have been jacked up, is now like, oh, we're fucked. <laughs> like, yeah, because, and, and because they they're going to go down uh, and, and score. Yeah. They're going to yeah. get or have a chance to score. Yeah. Well, and now they're going to be under immense pressure, no matter what. They're trying. Like Unbelievable. All right, we're coming back with more. We've been uh, trying to throw to this break here for the last 10 minutes, but uh, we're coming back with more. John Conjemi. It's uh, John Conjemi's Pigskin Playbook and uh, also uh, the uh, a uh, Dateline Dolphins all at once. And uh, we'll get into some college football, too. A lot of interesting stuff happening there. Matt Rule gets fired uh, in Carolina. And, uh, wow, I mean, uh, so far, you would have to say, a very compelling NFL season. Oh, I mean, just, just a lot of good stuff happening there. All right, back with more in a moment. Now that. The time. Date 36. The ponies in style at Champions, the outstanding simulcasting room at beautiful Hylia Park. Yes, the grand old lady of thoroughbred racing has never been more vibrant, and you can wager on the races from the top tracks around the country while enjoying a cocktail at the Brass Rail Bar or any of the fine food served throughout the facility. If poker is your game, you're covered in style. And you can play all your favorite Vegas-style games, including blackjack, craps, and roulette in Hylia Park's sizzling hot casino. Get a player's card when you walk through the door for all kinds of generous amenities, including our favorite, free play. When you come out to the ultimate casino and entertainment destination, Hylia Park. Hey folks, Tony Segretto here. You know, since day one, Catholic Health Services has been part of old school. And since we've started letting people know about them, it's changed their lives. You see, Catholic Health Services, while being recognized as one of the top places for stroke rehab in the country, it's also about a group of people who not just excel in what they do, from the doctors to the nurses to the therapist, on and on and on. It's how they do what they do every single day that separates them from the pack. They do it with a passion, unmatched, and the inclusion of family in every step of the process. Trust me when I tell you this, if you want the best unmatched rehab with a special group of skilled caring people, there is truly only one place. And that one place is Catholic Health Services. These days, we're all looking for comfort anywhere we can find it. Thank goodness for Landlubbers, Raw Bar and Grill in the plantation location because they are making sure you are as comfortable as possible. First of all, they're not only open for delivery and pickup. All you have to do is go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both pickup and free delivery. Their hours have changed a little bit. Monday through Thursday from 3.30 to 10. And Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11.30 to 10, you're going to have the best wings in the world. You're going to have a great burger. You're going to have their amazing soups. Again, Landlubbers, Raw Bar, and Grill. It's nice and easy. Just go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both your pickup and free delivery. Thank goodness for Landlubbers for making you always feel right at home. Jimmy Johnson uh, joins us here on the program, along with John Conjemi, and it's Dateline Dolphins, of course, uh, Leslie Visser, the lovely and talented one. It was always different. You, you had to know if it was Emmett Smith, if you screamed at him, he was going to go into a shell. I wasn't going to get anything out of him for the rest of the day. If it's Charles Haley, you know, he was going to get upset at me and maybe threaten me all my life. And, <laughs> and mean it. Yeah, but, and mean it. And, and he could have done it, too, I promise. <laughs> But when he went into my office, he said, Coach, just get on to me one-on-one. -on -one. Don't do it in front of the other players. Now, Michael Irvin, I could cuss him like a sailor. And the, <laughs> the, the more I cussed him, the harder he worked. From South Florida, entire world, thank you to the iHeartRadio app. Here is Defoe joined by Luby on the Defoe Show. All right, welcome back to the show. Uh, Jeff DeForest, Mike Luby, Lubitz, and a, uh, someone in the dark, uh, John Kajemi. Yeah, uh, my, my uh, lighting went out, Defo. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah? All out. right. Uh, pull up the... Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we were a little bit uh, concerned there. All of a sudden, it was like, uh, you know, a uh, caricature of Rod Serling you know, popping up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we were entering the Twilight Zone. All right, uh, uh, John Kajemi with us here. It's John Kajemi's Pigskin Playbook, yes, Dateline sir. Dolphins. I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, always a good time. Now, we want to get into some college football. Uh, congratulations, first off, your uh, Pittsburgh Panthers uh, coming up 45-29 over Virginia Tech. And, and it brings up the magic question, did you ever play at Virginia Tech? No, I only broadcast uh, games there. By the time okay. we were playing, uh, no, never played Virginia Tech. 
Your characterization of the fans would be what, John Kajemi? I mean, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, looking to uh, cast a negative light on the hillbillies and the sickos <laughs> that are in Blacksburg, uh, Virginia there. And uh, you're, you're thinking, wow, I mean, are th what technical aspect of things are these people studying? <laughs> Obviously, there are no dentists in this town. Oh, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's That's a, a rough lively, place, though. A it's rough a lively place. Lively group, man. Yeah. It is a it is a it, it is a, a great bunch of uh, hometown fans there for sure. Um, you know, it's funny. They have a, a a beautiful campus, big, vast campus, and they have a walk. You know, you kind of go through. Yeah. And you just everybody's got a flask, and everybody's just kind of you know just take partaking and walking up and and having a good time. And the student section's huge there, and then. They kind of, you know, enter Sandman, you know, getting into the stadium. So it's a, it's a great, uh, if you're, if you're playing there as a part of the Hokies, it's a great home, home crowd advantage and, you know, stadium advantage to be playing there in Blacksburg for sure. Kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, everybody's carrying muskets as they come into the game. <laughs> <laughs> a scarier environment, uh, your opinion, uh, playing in Blacksburg against Virginia Tech. Or uh, Clemson uh, against the Clemson Tigers because uh, that that stadium uh, is uh, you know I mean you have to go down like a dirt road and uh, you're going down uh, you're seemingly going down into purgatory if you're a visitor and uh, overwhelming I mean just just resounding support there you know for for the Clemson Tigers and then they do that whole business with the buses and they come down to the, you know we were talking about that last week on the show uh, you know I mean a sensational atmosphere there but but very scary I would think for a visitor. Yeah, uh, Clemson's not an easy place to play either. You know, the sound in that stadium just kind of stays there. And it's the same way with Virginia Tech. You know, I, I think Virginia Tech, as all stadiums evolve and fan bases evolve, it, it seems like the more money that are getting into, you know, athletics and especially with football, they just keep expanding the stadium. So Lane Stadium, you know, in Blacksburg wasn't that big 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Now they've added, you know, the suites on the home side. They've closed in, you know, the, the one end zone and made it higher. And uh, same way, you know, at, at, at Clemson, they just went through a, a renovation there with the, where they run down, you know, and touch the rock and run down the hill there. They have a brand new scoreboard that encloses that entire side. So much more intimidating and much more of a, of a closed end feel, even though the stadium's open on that side. Not meaning to even imply that I would be inclined to incite a riot, but, uh, you know, and, and this was the tough part for me this week in college football. Uh, as um, I would love to see, like, Conor McGregor come with, with uh, you know, some kind of battering ram and, and just jam it through the window of the Alabama team bus. You know, and I'm assuming that Nick Saban sits right in the front seat there by the driver, you know, the first one over, and, and take out Saban. I mean, facetiously, I say that, but uh, – I'm waiting for somebody to knock off Alabama. We had him by the jugular twice, right? Hey, Jimbo Fisher, my Jimbo God. had him. He had him. What was this play call on fourth and goal? Uh, where, I mean, they didn't even throw the ball into the end zone. Now, what, what on earth? You had a chance. To, how lucky is Nick Saban? Not only is the guy, you know, the, uh, you know, best of, of the lot when it comes to uh, directing a program, uh, but, wow, uh, the luckiest son of a bitch I've ever seen. <laughs> well, lucky and, and, and good, you know, you have anytime there's some luck involved and you, and you mix it with a really good football team, things are going to go your way most of the time. And, and also, you know, the defender, I, I can't remember what defender it was and, and what he was looking to the Texas A&M sidelines. He actually read Jimbo Fisher's lips oh, about yeah. who they wanted to throw the football to. Wow. So he passed that information along. And that's why, you know, the guy really never even got off the line of scrimmage. No, you know, and the quarterback was only going that way. But on a fourth down, I, I would think you'd have a better dial up a better play with a couple options. If they take away one, you're going to go here, you know, and spread spread the field out. But they just they decided to go back to a play that was successful earlier in the game. And Alabama not only knew what was coming, but they acted upon it and had had no chance from from the snap. It looked like a very low percentage play uh, anyway. I mean, obviously, if it was sniffed out by the uh, defense before it even happened, that made it even worse. But I, I was thinking they go with the old John Kachemi audible call and, and get the quarterback draw to uh, have the guy just uh, roll right up what would have been a very wide open middle, uh, you know, after a split second, 
after the snap, and, and, and the guy just walks into the end zone and, and wins the game. And Alabama's defeated, and maybe even OOP, as they used to say in dog racing, out of the picture for the playoffs. Well, they did. Didn't they drop a, a they dropped to three? In, the three in yeah. Ohio State moves up to two, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so, sir. Yeah, Buckeyes um, right there, yeah. number two. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. The Tennessee Alabama game will be a really good football game. I mean, Tennessee. You don't think so, Louie? You know, I don't know what to do with head. Tennessee. Like, I, I know Hendon and and then Hooker's turned into this great quarterback. I just remember the dude from Virginia Tech, and I'm I don't. Yeah. Have, a solid coach, but I remember a guy that I was sort of underwhelmed with at UCF. So was, I'm just so confused that so quickly he turned them into a top 10 team. I, I don't know what well, to do with them. I, I kind of think I have a, a, an idea maybe why it's the system and yeah. it, it's, it's, it's a system that allows him to spread the field, go at a certain pace. And when you're going at that, yeah. that type of tempo with more room on the field, when you escape, there's everybody's got their back turned because mostly it's man coverage. So he's he's allowing his legs to kind of you know not not be the first option, but it, it's it's something that he's able to take advantage of because he is so athletic and he's big and he's throwing the football with a lot more confidence. Because when you get into that type of offense and you're spread out a little bit more, you have a little bit more room. Things are a little bit widely they're defined a little bit better. You can read your receivers a little bit more, and and you get in rhythm. And at, in the second half of games, you're going against defenses that are dog tired by then. So yeah. things are a little bit easier right now for Tennessee. And I think Tennessee um, is probably been better than just about everybody they've played. You know, I think they played Pitt to overtime, but other games they they felt like they were the better team. And I think they're going to feel like they're not you know a step down from Alabama this year, which should lead to a really good football game. John Kajemi, the Pigskin Playbook here on the Depot Show. Jeff DeForest, uh, Mike Luby Lubitz. Uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, something that you said uh, obviously stood out to me. I, I think it goes as far back as maybe last year. Uh, we were talking about the University of Miami, and you put them in a category of maybe being like in the same parallel as an Appalachian state, that that may be you know, the, the status that they have to uh, you know, try to overcome uh, you know, for, for maybe a long time uh, into the future. So, so they get uh, Mario Cristobal, and uh, they, they hire like a real professional coaching staff. They get this guy, uh, what was his name? Is it uh, Radakovich or something? Uh, as, the, uh, as the athletic director, he's supposed to be like a wheeler dealer, but maybe that's on the business side. Uh, but obviously a guy that's uh, going to accommodate Mario Cristobal with, with whatever he can from a financial standpoint to uh, help him try and build a winner. And then we're seeing what's happening out there. Uh, you know, another loss to North Carolina. Mac Brown, how old is Mac Brown? Uh, did you work with Mac Brown at all uh, in your? Uh, contact I know Mac ESPN? Brown. I, yeah, yeah I, I've I've been at, in the meetings and all that stuff with Mac. Yeah. Oh, Mac, how old is this guy? Uh, is Mac he, looked, is he like Mac looked like he could have been a, a Kansas City Chief fan. Yes, uh, yes, he put on a few. Yeah, he's 71. 71. He, Max he's been, a great he's been guy, hanging out with, uh, really yeah, yeah, and obviously a good coach, uh, you know, in uh, North Carolina, not the easiest program to, uh, you know, have uh, perpetually at the top. But nonetheless, uh, that being said, I, I thought that they were going to beat uh, the University of Miami because uh, Miami looked so bad, uh, you know, against Middle Tennessee State. Uh, you're thinking, wait a minute, now they're playing a decent team, capable of scoring a lot of points. Uh, I know uh, they're probably not going to do well here. They are at home. It shots to win a game uh, and, and, and fell short again. So uh, now sitting there with a losing record, uh, Mario, a very likable guy. Uh, but I, I thought this, it just struck me that coaches that, that have the stature that should command like $8 million a year salaries that are supposed to be turnaround guys, with the transfer ability, shouldn't they all be somewhat like Lincoln Riley, where not only are they going to the school, but they're going to bring like you know five key players with them. Uh, from from some, from good programs, they're going to be attracted to the fact that this guy's the head coach there. Uh, that didn't really happen. I mean, shouldn't you be able, if you're that caliber of coach, to kind of get a program going, you know, and and juiced up immediately in the right direction because of what essentially has become an open market for players in college football? Well, doesn't that give you a better indication of where you think Miami is nationally? I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I think I think it does. Uh, there's used to be in you know the 80s and 90s and everybody always goes back to that because that's where the fan base still is they still think they're miami of you know they're going to beat everybody they're going to beat you up and then beat you on the scoreboard it doesn't matter 
We're going to win every, any, you know, anytime we walk out, we're going to be the best team. And they were nine times out of 10, they were, but the fan base has never evolved to, to accept that, you know, that only happens for uh, a short period of time, you know, a decade, you know, if you're lucky, you know, Alabama has a great run. Miami has a great run. Oklahoma had those runs. Nebraska had, had those runs. You know, there's a lot of t- colleges around the country that have runs like that. Uh, and that can sustain to be good over a period of time. Bobby Bowden did that at Florida state, you know, Steve Spurrier did that at Florida. Uh, but you, you get spoiled. Okay. And you got four and five star recruits. At least that's what it says. And then they come in and, you know, you're switching coordinators. Then you switch, then you get fired as a head coach. Then you're switching coordinators again. Then you have a new system that now, now you're going to be an attacking defense. Now you're going to be this type of defense. And you never really find an identity to go along with the, the caliber of athlete that you're recruiting. I think if they had kept the offense from last year, that type of offense from last year, even though the receiving core has gone down in terms of consistency and catching the football, I think Van Dyke would have had a little bit easier time earlier in the season. Uh, now it almost feels like he, he, he doesn't fit what they're trying to do as he as easily as he did last year especially when he went on that run so you know you you try to roll the dice with a new coach and new coordinators and new philosophy and like i said the thing i never get over you know miami's getting beat on the field yet they've got you know 10 guys in green shirts that are running out on the field grabbing people and trying to jack them up and it it just you know just feels like it's it's all fake you yeah. know, just that, that whole thing game. with the four before the yeah, fourth just quarter. Go, just go play the game and yeah. and see where we end up. You know, just that that's my take. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah no, it's ugliness. Uh, you know, you hate to see it. Uh, you know, I couldn't help but think uh, Holy Stanley Shakespeare and Eddie Brown, man. We used to have like dynamic tandems out there. Yeah. That, that oh, and I will and plans. I will say the thing that the worst thing about it is they used to find guys from all over the country predominantly the Northeast to come down and play offensive line. Yeah. And when they got here, they were marginal, but when they left, they were really good. I don't think I've seen a Miami offensive line improve from no. one year to the next, to the next with, with the same people, they get worse. And it, and it only that plagues them because you can't control the running game or you can't pass block with any consistency. And right now Miami's looking for somewhat of consistency on offense. What do we do really well well, they can't find out because it's 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 a leaky boat in front of Van Dyke all the time. Whether Very frustrating. He's trying to run yeah. the ball or throw it. All right, uh, you know, and this is interesting. I mean, it's on a different level, but uh, the uh, FIU Panthers fire Butch Davis, who was, uh, I guess, coaching the team for about a million bucks a year. A I didn't even know that, Defo, to be quite honest with oh, you. Oh, this this was a while ago. Okay, and they brought in they brought in this uh, guy. No, who, I know. Uh, I, was I a veteran remember. coach. I thought he I thought he went on his own. I thought he left on his own. I can't Who's that, remember. Butch? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I think he wanted to be there. I, I, yeah, I really believe okay. that. Okay. They, they, were, uh, they were tired of each other? Is that the deal? Like, like no, mutual consent? He wanted him out. He wanted to stay. There was like a whole yeah. thing. Oh, That's okay. What I, I, I forgot that whole scenario. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he seemed like, you know, very dedicated, Butch. It was kind of an admirable thing because this guy was at the highest levels. I mean, he was coaching on the hey, professional he, ranks. He, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so now he's doing his thing, and it's kind of nice. I like seeing that. I like seeing some some guy that was coaching going back to his high school, you know, or whatever, or, you know, it has a prominent name in coaching. But I thought Butch, it was kind of cool. A nice fit there made FIU somewhat relevant. Uh, they brought in a guy who it was like the, the absolute most enthusiastic coach I, I have ever seen, and, and he had me believing that uh, this program uh, maybe was going to, you know, prosper with him uh, running the show. And it shows you how difficult it can be to transition because, you know, Butch is a dynamite recruiter. We know that. I mean, uh, uh, look at the people he had at the University of Miami. North Carolina wasn't much, you know, before uh, Butch got there. Now, there may have been some scandalous stuff, uh, you know, all. uh, It'll all be above the books now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would be favorable, you know, to do these things, I I guess. But uh, but anyway, if I where have they fallen? Uh, John and Jimmy. And I I, I wish I could remember the name of the coach, but. The uh, University of Texas San Antonio, which I believe is an online school, is favored by like 30 something points over FIU this week. So, so, I mean, it's not always beneficial to, you know, have these situations where, 
you know, you, you sour on a guy. I mean, this is the total reverse where, where you had the profile coach that might be able to uh, give you a shot. And, um, uh, and now you're, you're underdogs by 30 points to an online school. I mean, that, that's a total collapse of a program. That, <laughs> it's not an online school. Well, we were friends with Ron Turner, man, a real nice guy. And he, he kept yeah, going Ron's like three Ron and three and nine. There. Yeah. Oh, he did. Yeah. That's fine. Boy, well, very nice. Yeah. I mean, a great guy. He seemed to be yeah. very knowledgeable. I don't great know guy. that he was a spectacular, you know, effective head coach. I, I guess people would look at his tenure with the Bears and say, uh, <laughs> how'd that go? But, uh, you know, certain certain properties and franchises just it, it's literally true. It's like Mickey talking to Rocky Balboa. You can't win. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't. I'm hoping that's not the case with the University of Miami, where, where that perpetuates itself, that. That you can't well, win, but I, I'm a little disappointed, I would have to say, in uh, what's happened so far. Well, I would think all Canes fans are disappointed, but you, you have to be able to believe that they're going to find a way to find players to fit what they're going to want to do. And if, if Mario Cristobal and his offensive line background and mentality can find players up front to fix what's going on up there, or maybe – change a little bit of the dynamic of what they're asking him to do, that that would be the quickest fix. Because once you do that, you're going to have a little bit more time for your, you know, quarterback that has a lot of ability to, to push the football down the field and to be able to, to pick the right guy and maybe to take a little zip off of a, a four yard pass and be able to just touch it out there and, and get, get guys in space that have ability to make people miss. I, I just think that Miami is searching right now. They don't know who they are, and they're not quite sure. You know, all the hand clapping and all the cheering and all the – they're not executing. You know, the, the untimely penalties, the, the you know, the, the shortcomings in the red zone on fourth down over the last couple of weeks, it's just led to, you know, them questioning themselves whether, you know, uh, here we go again. And once you have that here we go again feeling as a, as a team, man, that's an awful place to be. Did you ever consider, I know, uh, obviously, you, you, you've been uh, extremely successful as a broadcaster after your football playing days, and, and you do other things. I mean, uh, you know, you've got it going on, Jenka Jimmy. So uh, that's great. Did you ever consider going into coaching, though? Because um, is there a better job to fail at than being a head coach? <laughs> no, that is that is a great – that's a great point. Yeah, I, I, I did. I mean, when my kids were in high school, I, I would volunteer at St. Thomas and help out there with the younger kids and coach teams and You'd be great. coach players. And I, I, I don't know if I would be able to do it now only because, um, gosh, I, the time involved is just incredible. I, I like to do other things. Like I, I, I like talking about it and kind of sure. know, talking with my friends about what I would do in that situation or whatever. But I don't know if I, if my, uh, if that fire is still lit kind of high, where it would need to be uh, to do that as a full time basis. You have to figure Matt Rule is going to be a candidate for uh, various coaching <laughs> lots, of jobs. Uh, lots of college jobs, positions in college. Yeah, and, and uh, you know it, he walks away with like all of this sixty two million, I guess. Yeah, that uh, he, he was offered on a seven year deal when, when he signed with the Carolina Panthers. Who, uh, you know, what was his know. record like? Eleven and sixty two. Yeah, it's terrible. Or eleven something? and yeah, I, some I some ridiculous. Eleven and twenty seven. Eleven and twenty six, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> eleven and sixty two. I mean, you may as well have flipped <laughs> the numbers because it, it was doesn't going matter. Out. Yeah, I don't know if it matters, right? He, he They're going to make a lot of good players available, though. Uh, the uh, Carolina Panthers. So I would imagine there's going to be a scramble on. I mean, uh, you would have to think uh, McCaffrey probably gone. And uh, who, who's a wide receiver they have uh, that uh, everybody's going to be uh, going after? The uh, uh, what the heck? Uh, I, I wrote his name down. Oh, uh, DJ uh, Moore. DJ Moore. Yeah. Um, I mean, teams are going to, you know, there, there is already wild speculation as to where those guys are going to end up, because uh, I, I guess they end up stripping us down. I, I do like Ron Rivera, you know, singling out the fact that uh, Carson Wentz sucks. <laughs> and uh, you, you would normally never hear that from a coach where they say, hey, what do you think the problem is, Ron? And uh, coaching the Washington Commanders, and he goes, what do you think, guys? It's quarterback. <laughs> Carson Wentz happens to uh, be in that spot. Wow. I mean, did he go south in a hurry, this guy? You're right. I, I remember watching him live going, man, this guy, is I mean, he looks – he looks like, you know, he's 6'11". Looks when, like when Prince he Harry, doesn't he? Yeah. He, he, the guy's <laughs> throwing the ball guy. now, too. <laughs> yeah, but down in the red zone, gosh, that was – that was they had that game. They had a chance at the end there. 
Unbelievable, yeah. So uh, Ron Rivera, good guy. I mean, a very straightforward guy, as evidenced by the fact that it, you would never hear that. Even Belichick wouldn't say, hey, Brady sucks. That's why we got rid of him. So uh, anyway, uh, good time, oh, as always, John. I had a lot of fun today, and uh, it's always great having you on the show. Uh, we'll catch you next Monday. Jimmy Johnson's big chill. Uh, I mean, please, do whatever you can, I mean, to prod Tommy Fox into making these arrangements. We're going to get and we'll, Tommy – yeah. We're going to get Tommy out of protocol. I'm going to ask him a couple <laughs> of questions. I'll ask him about the fisherman's pizza. That should bring him yeah. back to life. Yeah. And, and if he tells you, uh, you know, when you ask him about the fisherman's uh, pizza, that, uh, yeah, he is looking forward to Christmas. Uh, you know, then, <laughs> you, you know, maybe uh, you, you should throw him in the same category as two in Bridgewater. You All right. Well, what do you think? Any shot this week against the Vikings? Uh, Dolphins at home. Uh, maybe playing their third string quarterback again. Yeah, it doesn't look good right now. I mean, as the week goes on, let's see if Dolphin fans, you know, you got to take a look at at the injury report and see where we're at because the Dolphins may be down not only two quarterbacks, they may be down a corner, they may be down an offensive tackle, uh, they may be down, you know, uh, hopefully wide receivers. You know, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think Tyreek's going to be okay, but that's something to monitor. You, may, they may be going into this home game, uh, you know, behind. <laughs> in terms of availability with players. Wow. All right. Uh, it's a uh, you know, bleaker picture than you would have thought uh, at the beginning of the year, and especially after the uh, 3-0 and start. All right, John, always a pleasure, my friend. You, you look great. I mean, even without the lights on, you look great. Thanks, guys. I'm surprised Just you weren't casting it. that uh, Showtime show, American Gigolo, as the lead, uh, you know, character, because, uh, I mean, uh, the guy has nothing on you, I can assure you. And he's kind of like a, a young Richard Gere. This cat. I don't know if you've been watching. I gotta show. check that out. No, I haven't. Yeah. I haven't seen that. Check it out. No, no. There's a congemmy look. And how you're so even tempered. It's hard to believe you're Italian, my friend. I mean, <laughs> oh no, really I, 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 I'm at a two right now. It goes to eight <laughs> or nine or ten, but try to keep it at a two. <laughs> All right, well, you you keep it wherever yeah. you want because uh, you're, you're great. Thanks so much for being with us. Hey, thanks, show. guys. Enjoy it. Right. See you next Monday. All right, John Kajemi, ladies and gentlemen, the Pigskin Playbook. There's a lot of stuff there. I don't know that we defined anything. I mean, uh, there are people that think that they're going to go on the air and uh, whatever kind of broadcast platform that you have, and uh, they're going to teach you something. I, I don't know that we did, except that it's okay to be insane because the rest of the world is going that direction if they're not there already. <laughs> All right, our Believe podcast today. Are, are you going to pop that up today? Because uh, uh, we're going to uh, conduct this thing in a few minutes here, but it'll be available about 11 o'clock on uh, BLEAV Network. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Tara Lipinski, the Olympic gold medal skater, who is now featured all the time as a commentator, not just on skating, but on the Kentucky Derby with Johnny Weir, also known as Johnny Weird. <laughs> and, and Johnny Weir, I mean, you would have to say, I mean, has a, has a unique approach to style, and, and especially when, when it comes to being a, a male in broadcasting. I, I, you know, I mean, is that fair? I mean, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I, I'm cool with it. I loved when he was fishing in, in nothing but a fur coat. <laughs> and where, they were in some, you know, where was uh, the Olympics, uh, Winter Olympics, where it was absolutely fucking freezing. And uh, Easy was the most recent one. And Thank he's you. fishing there and he catches something, which was the last thing he wanted to do. Because <laughs> now he had to wipe his hands on the fur coat. <laughs> anyway, we're going to bring this up with Tara Lipinski. Uh, she's got a new show That's called uh, Wedding Talk, which who better yeah. to conduct uh, an interview on Wedding Talk than uh, Luby and me? <laughs> <laughs> I start speaking in tongues when I start having Wedding Talk. All, all right. Um, we'll see you on that. I believe podcast. That's about 11 o'clock that pops up on uh, BLEAV Network. And at 12 o'clock, Mike Mayo's Lunchbox. Uh, Mayo became a, a Let's Eat South Florida fetcher himself. <laughs> Love it. And, and Andy was right. He probably lost 500 while he was at the Hard Rock, and now he's, uh, you know, complaining about the $5 soda. Unbelievable. <laughs> Mayo! The man who constantly, what does he harp on? His number one principle is, uh, you know what, don't complain about it. And if, if you don't like it, just don't go back there, right? Mm -hmm. I think he adopted that philosophy for me because uh, that was my uh, one of my early statements there on the show. Look, I mean, uh, if a restaurant doesn't appeal to you, uh, guess what? It's not going to circulate in your head. Wow, I really want to go back there, right? If you hate the place, well, why would you think of eating there again? You have a zillion choices. But, um, yeah, he, he doesn't like the catchers. And uh, yet, I, I know he'll be back at the Hard Rock, and he'll probably order another $5 seltzer. <laughs> that is criminal. 
All right. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, later on on uh, Believe Network and, and then also uh, Mike Mayo's Lunchbox. I'm Jeff DeForest. He's Mike Luby Lubitz. Tomorrow, Tony Segretto, Little Old School. Yeah. That's brought to you by Catholic Health Services and Texas Roadhouse Restaurants. And we'll see you later on as we leave you know that. The time. It is 9.05. Let's go to eat a damn snack. Let's be a big man to my show.